thank you. So uh, raise your hand if you're new to the event. All right. Well, lots of new people. Raise your hand if you're a part of the local food economy other than consumers. <laughs> How about raise your hand so people can see who y'all are. Part of the, okay, so good, good turnout. Good 15, 10, 15 people who are. Yeah, she's raised her hand, so you haven't decided whether to do it yet or not. You're there. All right, good. And uh, this is, uh, we're, somebody asked how long we've been doing this, and I've lost track, but it's somewhere around 20 years, but it's grown. And we're in a new room today, and uh, it's very exciting. I want to thank uh, Roadhouse for your great staff for putting this together. Uh, Zingerman's is uh, one of our sponsors, and they're, uh, the Roadhouse has been where we've been for about the last five or six years. And we have uh, great food. That's provided by Zingerman's Bakehouse, great coffee from Zingerman's Coffee. Catering has helped set this up, so all kinds of good stuff going on. Uh, and uh, yeah, I guess, is there a traffic pattern problem in the back? Maybe we could come around to the back and then come on up. Is there a room in the back? Pass up? Yeah, probably that's the best way to do it. But on the center uh, aisle, there's a center aisle here, yeah. So we're getting used to how to use the facilities here. So I want to thank Zingerman's, and they've been a great sponsor, of course, a great member of the community. What are your 30, what's the anniversary coming up? 35. 35 this year. Yeah. You guys having a celebration in the summer? Or we're we're all a celebration. Always celebrating. Yeah. So how many of you uh, are consumers of food? Anybody eat? <laughs> yeah, I've been on eat. <laughs> I can tell there's a few, a few that definitely have their, their proof of proof of concept here. So, uh, not about it. Larry, I'm glad that, uh, that you you know came out there. And, you know, I'm going to affirm. He's, he's affirming, yeah. And actually, one of the uh, a landowner because it, it's Larry Dolph's Dolph's Park. Yes. Know, so great nature area. Uh, how long ago was it the family dedicated that park? Well, it was a gift to the city in 54. 54, yeah. wow, wow. And it's 54 acres. Oh, wow, 54 so, acres. So figure. And you're 54. Yeah. yeah. Very good. So 54 is playing on the, if any of you play the numbers, that's the number of the day. And uh, I want uh, also to thank Bank of Ann Arbor. Uh, Chris, is it Chris, come up and talk about Bank of Ann Arbor. And, Chris is not going to reveal the secret right yet, right, Chris? That's correct. Yeah, we have our Sonic Lunch uh, lineup being announced today, but I, I don't want to uh, spoil the surprise, so they'll we'll be announced later this morning. But uh, on behalf of Bank of Ann Arbor, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, I want to let you know how pleased we are to be a sponsor of the uh, Leaders Connect program and uh, want to introduce our new logo. So if you look at the banner, um, uh, yeah, ooh, ah, uh, ooh, ah, thank you, that's good, uh, and, and uh, you know, one thing about the new logo I think is very appropriate, uh, I'm sure y'all don't have the old one, the new one memorized, but uh, one change is I noticed is that Bank and Ann Arbor is the same size, and before it was Bank, of Ann Arbor. Uh, and now it's the same size. I think that's very appropriate because Ann Arbor is such a big part of uh, uh, the people that work at the bank, of our business customers, our retail customers. Uh, we manage about a billion dollars in the trust department uh, for uh, Ann Arbor area families. So I really think it's appropriate now that they're both the same size because we're really intertwined with the business and, and individual community here in Ann Arbor. So. Uh, again, uh, we're pleased to be a sponsor. I want to introduce a couple of my colleagues that are here. Jackie Jenkins, my colleague in the Trust Department. Uh, Charlie Crone, our Chief Revenue Officer. And uh, I think that's it. Um, so again, uh, thanks. How about all the people that bank it? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. And uh, Charlie said, Chris said he's going to give five dollars for each customer, right? As, as a, as that's <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, giving money away. That's what we do. Uh, so again, thank you, and we're, we're uh, very, very pleased to be a sponsor. Thanks, Dr. Rob. Thank you. Uh, so this is uh, it's, it's very exciting. We also try to highlight 
Uh, when we were about 30, 40 people, everybody got to introduce themselves. Now I can only, I have to call out certain people. And Jackie Jenkins, Jackie, can you stand up where are you? Jackie, stand up. And your daughter, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. Good morning. <laughs> what is your name? Oh, Courtney. Courtney. Courtney is going to be starting at Plant Moran. Is that what I heard? Yes, yeah. I started in January. Great. So keeping keeping it local here. So that's good. <laughs> glad, glad to have you here, Courtney. And uh, Jackie knows who's going to be at Sonic Lunch, but she can't tell us till 8:30 when Tim Marshall is going to be announcing it on 107.1, right? Correct. Correct. So maybe at the end of this, Jackie will give us. Uh, but can, can you just tell us whether the person who happens to be on the voice will be part of it? <laughs> I, I can't steal Tim's thunder, but after 8.30 we can share the I heard, secret. I heard from somebody else who works for you that has gray hair. That, that he might have, be there. He might be there. So, yeah. yeah. We always break it up. We always break news here. At, uh, yeah. after, after 8.30. Yeah. Right? All right, after 8.30. And, uh, I also try to highlight some folks who are uh, startup people, or we also try to promote uh, students. I teach uh, at the university and uh, like to bring in students, particularly those that are looking for opportunities uh, here. So, uh, Matt, you want to stand up? Oh, God, you're waiting back. Come on up, Matt. Uh, Matt is uh, looking for an opportunity. For the summer, right? Internship is graduating, fifth year senior, and you're going to be playing for, uh, I forget the coach's name. What's the guy that's uh, uh, Coach Harbaugh. Harbaugh, that's it. I knew that. Was, I, I had. So, Matt, can you just tell us about yourself, maybe what you're you're looking for for the summer? Here, can you use the mic? Pretty deep voice. Yeah, you sound <laughs> but uh, I'm a, so, as the professor just said, I'm a senior right now, and uh, for the summer, I'm looking for an internship in sales or marketing. Uh, it isn't not really in particular right now in doing anything and, uh, for the summer months. Um, okay, so what is, uh, where, what is, what's your degree in, you say? Uh, I'm a general studies major. Okay, great. And what's your position? I'm a defensive lineman. And uh, what's the, how big are we going to beat Ohio State this year? So. Uh, I, don't like, I don't like to make predictions. But, uh, we'll, we'll win the game. <laughs> Where's Vince Smith? Vince, can you stand up? You don't have to come up, but I just want to point Vince out. He's also a UVF football star for a few years back. And uh, Vince is uh, part of the food scene here. He's going to be talking. Can you just shout out what your uh, your organization is, Vince? Uh, basically, in a short, long song, it's called Team Garden and the uh, Hashtag Eating Project, where athletes engage into the community, teaching the kids uh, about like healthy foods and healthy nutrition and just getting pumped about fruits and veggies. That's great. All right. Great. And um, also Karen Diggs. Come on up, Karen. You're right here. Uh, drinks. And uh, Karen just won a pitch contest last day. It was a five-minute version. Uh, it was in the food area, right? Yes. So maybe you could give us the 30-second version of it, all right? <laughs> all right. I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to participate in the Washtenaw County, or excuse me, Washtenaw Community College Pitch Contest last night. It was sort of their version of Shark Tank, and I gave a five-minute pitch about what I do. I own Sleepy Cricket Healthy Vending. I provide healthy snacks and beverages in places where people expect to find junk food, and it seems to be going really well. I've had 500% growth in the last year. Thanks. Great examples of stuff going on uh, in the community and a nice pitch. What were the uh, what was the key element for you, Karen, in terms of why you think you won? What, what, what does it take to give a good pitch? Humor. Humor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right. I, I think, uh, I've been accused of that occasionally. By the way, talk about the new logo. Is Ernie here? Ernie Parrish. I know he signed up, and I, I guess he didn't. He's not here yet. If he comes in, but Ernie is uh, the marketing genius behind. The Ann Arbor, uh, Bank of Ann Arbor campaign. So uh, if he's here, we'd love to point him out and have him uh, introduce uh, himself to the group. Uh, I want to introduce uh, James Murray. Where's James? Right here. Come on up, James. And uh, James, another startup opportunity here. Young man coming into the community. And uh, maybe you can say what you're up to. Hi, I'm James. I'm a 
Hi, my name is James Murray from Murray Consultant. You can put the mic, it's got to get close. There you go. We provide business solutions to start up developing companies like myself. We focus on recruiting, market analysis, and employee benefit management. And um, I hope to work with you guys in the near future. All right. Okay, very good. James, if uh, they want to reach you, where do they, what's the, what's the uh, website? Actually, my website is up in, uh, it's up and coming because it's very, uh, <laughs> it's All right, we'll, we'll get it out there. <laughs> I think a good, a good website for you would be upandcoming.com. <laughs> People, a lot, of, a lot of go there for it. Now, I want to also introduce uh, some of my team, um, which is growing. Uh, Diana, is Diana in the room, or she might be in the other room still helping folks out, but Diana is uh, a very able assistant, and uh, Diana just wanted to say hi, and she's keeping everybody uh, informed about what's going on is really up my game in terms of uh, getting myself, getting me organized, which is a big job. <laughs> Kathleen is looking like, what are you talking about? There's no way. But uh, she's trying. But I, I also have been expanding. I run, uh, many of you are part of Leaders Connect groups, small groups of about 10 people that meet monthly to talk about uh, business challenges and uh, just what you're trying to do, managing a lifestyle as, a, as an entrepreneur. Uh, how many in the room have been part of that group in the, in the past? There's several people out there. I know, uh, so if you're interested in that, please talk to folks, Hans, there's several people, Steve. But uh, if, um, let's see, uh, Dunry, Steve, I don't know if Marvin's here. Could you guys just stand up for a second? Steve Angerman. Um, they are working with me as well as Marvin Parnes on expanding the Leaders Connect groups. And uh, Benry is doing the uh, material development. We're trying to write some, uh, some books around that, pamphlets about emotional intelligence, personal leadership plans. Uh, Steve, who's with Running Fit, one of the founders of Running Fit, and Dunry are co-leading groups, and I'm trying to train them, I am training them, about running groups. So we hope in the, uh, in the fall we're going to roll out uh, some new groups that we're offering. We want to do some things around uh, people in transition. Uh, several of you in the room, how many are in transition in the sense of you're between one job or another? All right. So yeah, we hope to launch a group where we can get those people to meet on a regular basis and uh, help people figure out what to do next. So thank you very much. It's uh, my growing team. And uh, let's see, who else am I supposed to say hi to? Um, forgive me if I've forgotten anybody that I said I would say hi to, but I want to move on with the program real quickly. And we're excited uh, today. Uh, I know Bill and Kathy way back um, when they came to talk to me, I know I know Bill for probably ten years, uh, back in the Inspirion days, and uh, Bill and Kathy will tell their story. But they were both uh, in the corporate world and decided they wanted to get a little bit more local, change change the direction of their life, and uh, they uh, met with me for several months and. Uh, during that process came up with the idea of Argus Farm Stop. So they're here and they're going to talk about their experience. How many of you have been to the Farm Stop? All right. And then uh, Alex and I met probably, how many years has this been going about? 10, 15 years? Of, yeah, a little more. How many years have you been to the Roadhouse? 13, coming up. 13 years, wow, 14. Fantastic. So um, I was, you know, after I got over my initial shock that I couldn't get Bill Knapp's chocolate cake here. <laughs> Their olive burger was pretty good too, but uh, you know, Alex has done a great job of building a fantastic, to me the premier restaurant, there's only one place I go when people come to town, uh, and that's uh, the Roadhouse, it's just a great place. And uh, by the way, we're gonna try to organize uh, an afternoon uh, drinking event here. So, uh, Leaders Connect, I only know you all in the town. There's probably the same number of people who come to Leaders Connect that don't come to Leaders Connect because they're not really morning people, so I'm going to call them out on it. And we're just going to have an informal, uh, you know, beer tasting or wine tasting kind of thing here uh, in the next month or so. And uh, we'll do it in, in a late afternoon and uh, give people a chance to go a bit more networking. So. Alex will help us set that up and so 
like the good treats. So what we're going to do this morning is kind of an informal uh, chat where I'm going to uh, let Bill and Kathy and uh, Alex talk. And then we're going to have a conversation between us and then we're going to open it up. The, the goal of this is to try to encourage, uh, electrify, if you will, the uh, local food uh, movement. And we're going to try to uh, give everybody who's here from that world, uh, both in uh, Ann Arbor, and I see a couple people from Detroit. I know you're from, how many people from Detroit are here that are part of that? A couple people that are opening up a Argus Farm Stop in Corktown. So, so it's going to be really cool. And uh, right here, Tiger Stadium, the old Tiger Stadium. So I'm going to turn this over now to Kathy and Bill, and you guys can uh, talk. And, uh, who wants to start? I guess I can start. All right, Bill. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm just a, just a call to Rahani and Kiki who have been working on their, their store is called The Farmer's Hand. And we'll give them a chance to talk about that a little bit, but it should be opening soon and, and bringing uh, a neighborhood gathering spot and some great local food energy to that part of Detroit. Um, so it's it's great to be here. It's a little bit humbling. Uh, Rob's had a lot of great speakers here. And so when he asked us to come, we were a little bit odd, uh, but we appreciated the opportunity to tell the story of what we've been up to at Argus. Um, I'll also uh, like to you know, thank Xerman's for hosting this and, and Ari in particular as well for inspiring some of this. When you go listen to him talk about leadership and what workplace can be, you know, it starts a lot of uh, things moving and, um, and it helps to inspire ideas like, like Ari. He'll so. be speaking here in June on this new book. So. Okay, in June on a new book. Yeah. Um, I also just reiterate what Rob said. Uh, his small groups on transitions are really helpful, um, and we've been part of those, Kathy and I both, uh, where you get a chance to look, reflect on what you're doing and what you may want to do and try to navigate a pathway in your career. Um, and um, so I want to thank Rob for that. Um, and also there's some here that talked with Kathy and I. You know, we spent six months um, really having a lot of conversations in the community about local food. Um, and the Argus concept, and um, we weren't originally thinking that we were going to open Argus Farm Stop. We were trying to get someone else to open Argus Farm Stop, um, and we were unsuccessful. And but everyone encouraged us that the idea is really um, a good one and, and important for Ann Arbor. So what we're going to do uh, this morning, Kathy and I'll describe. Uh, I'll start and go through the background of local food in Ann Arbor and kind of the way we view it, and um, and Kathy's going to move into then Argus Farm Stop and, and how it operates. For those who haven't been there, it's kind of a hybrid between a, a farmer's market uh, where you get to meet the farmers. The economics are extremely favorable for the farmers, uh, but it's open every day and it has the refrigeration and display like a, like a real grocery store. And so it brings local food to a, to a next level. Um, so to start off with on the, on the local food, you know, why is local food important? Um, and I'll, I'll start with the main reason for me, um, and maybe for many of you, is, is taste. Um, food that is fresher, uh, it tastes better. Um, when it's local, it tends to be fresher. There's also uh, a different goal when you're growing for taste, and things like heirloom tomatoes are a perfect example. You get a Corman Farms heirloom tomato, that's a wonderful uh, work of art. Uh, but that thing won't travel, um, you know, across the country on a truck. It won't make it. And so, you know, the food that's been bred for transportation in the industrial food system tends to be great in a truck, but it doesn't really taste that great on your plate. Um, and so when we were originally thinking about local food, one of the main inspirations was just taste and bringing that kind of taste more broadly because, well, a lot of people know about heirloom tomatoes. There's examples of that throughout all kinds of different areas of produce of the local variety that's been forgotten um, that is really amazing um, but it's just not one that can be distributed nationally and so it gets overlooked um, i think another reason for for local food is that it really supports the local businesses and local farms and has an impact on, on the local economy and so um, you know the raises the question of you know what kind of town do you want to live in what kind of community do you want to have um, do you want to be surrounded by, by farms? Uh, uh, do you want to or, or be surrounded by you know developments? Um, and um, and to be you know more intentional about you know how do you make the decisions? Like you think carefully about a lot of things you purchase, uh, but with food, 
um, if you're intentional about it, you can really support and make a difference in the next 10 years to have this this area be one that's thriving in a local food um, in, a, in a local food context. So, I think um, taken all together, I think this has led a lot of people to be more intentional about the way they think about food. Um, and it's, it's one of the main reasons why Kathy and I started exploring different avenues on, on, on local food. And, um, um, and it, I'd say we were looking for the right area where there was a need. And that, I think, brought us to the main, the main issue that, that we found was local food shopping is not as easy as it should be. Um, if you're a consumer, you know, you know your farmer's markets and they're wonderful. But if you're out of town on Saturday or the day of your market, then normally your default is that you skip it and wait for another week. Um, so there's not a good you know, backup alternative. Um, if you try to shop local at a bigger store, and the bigger stores are doing a much better job now, uh, but it's still difficult. It's, it's, a, it's a job of really hunting and reading labels and trying to undercover if they have local. And, and it's just with, you know, way more work than it needs to be. And you know, wouldn't it be nice if you could come into a, a, an environment where everything was local? Um, so we're, I think from the consumer side, found a lot of issues with why local was, was difficult. Um, we, when we talked to uh, producers and those who are farming, we kind of found the same things, that the farmers have, have the same concerns. It's the, the farmers' markets are wonderful. They're a great experience, but they're really not the basis for a for a, uh, running a business. Um, they're, you know, if you're at one farmer's market, it's 30 days a year at most, and if you factor in bad weather, that probably knocks it down to 20. And so, you know, trying to run a business on 20 days a year certainly doesn't work. Um, so a lot of farms will double that, and they'll try to do two markets or three markets. Um, and now they're not on the farm two or three days a week. Um, you know, they expand to do uh, CSAs where you get the farm box delivered from the farm every week and, and those, those are also nice, um, but they take a lot of effort to uh, rejuvenate. There's a lot of turnover with those kind of farm share programs. And so really, you know, what we were finding uh, was a lot of difficulty with local farms being able to bring enough income in to make it, to make it work in spite of having huge demand. That lots of people want to buy local um, and support these farms, but it was like drinking through a small straw trying to connect this huge consumer demand and all of these local producers who want to produce. Um, I think that the, the, the so I'm, I'm doing the, the problem part of the setup, but Kathy's gonna to get to the solution, so I'll, get, I'll, I'll keep going on, on more of the depressing part of this. Uh, <laughs> No role play. Yeah, yeah. Um, it you know turns out that we're not unique. Um, over 99% of the food in America comes through that industrial channel, uh, where it's it's bought on a dist or grown on a district farm, uh, shipped on average uh, over 1,500 miles, um, and then it arrives on your plate. And by the end of that journey, the farmer who grew it gets 17 cents on the dollar, um, and you get food that's been kind of in transit for for a long time. And at the same time, you see your local farms struggling, um, you know, to make a living. Um, when we looked at Washtenaw County in particular, we also found that there are farms uh, certainly at risk, and we're and we're at risk of losing the capability to grow food in the county. Uh, we did an exercise to compare what Washtenaw County was like in 1950, um, and the Ag Department does a, a thorough census. Um, where they describe exactly how many farms and what was grown. Uh, we compared that to 2012, and it was really a dramatic change. Um, over half the farmland has, has, has disappeared, um, but more importantly, it's been a complete shift from food-focused growing uh, to soybeans and corn and, and, and commodity crops. Um, and so we felt that um, there needs to be something that can help reverse this. Um, the average age of the farmer in Michigan is, is 58 and, 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 and going up. Um, and what we found was even with the really inspirational young farmers, like the ones you meet um, that are trying to come into this business, um, they have a 50% uh, dropout rate within five years. And so they get into it with all kinds of emotion and ready to go and energy. But you know, by the time multiple years goes by, you, know, you just can't make a living. Um, and I'd say they're, you know, they're trying a lot of things. They're trying CSAs, multiple markets, selling to restaurants, and it's, and it's difficult. And so I think um, 
you know, I think for these reasons, you know, we felt like there's a choice. Like this isn't something you just have to accept. Um, and we felt like it was imperative to be able to support the local food economy. Um, so as we kind of turn the corner to like more like the solution side, uh, what's possible uh, going forward is the question. And I, I think the fact that all of you are here today is a great sign of, of the support that is there for initiatives like this. Um, just to call out a few additional names that are here, I think Brett Seaver is here, grows, you can wave your hand, uh, grass-fed uh, beef and lamb and uh, poultry, eggs. I don't know if Annie Hilker's here with uh, her local, uh, locally developed uh, dog treats um, that she also sells through Argus. Um, you know, so why Annie? Annie. Yeah, sorry, no okay. But again, you know, why you have a choice? You know, you can buy Purina dog treats, or you can buy Annie's, and you know, um, for things like that that are available locally, um, you know, to give the nod to the local producer, whether it's a farm um, uh, or a or a producer, either way is is all good. Um, uh, Barry Lana has been preserving farmland and helping make um, the transition from, um, you know, making sure that farmland is protected from development for years. Uh, is, where's Barry? Barry's. 6,000 acres, right, Barry? Yeah. 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 Barry's, uh, Barry's one of my hometown boys from Oak Park, Michigan. Oh, okay. Great farmland oh, back in the 40s, yeah. maybe. But. <laughs> 80, 80, 80, 80. <laughs> <laughs> I saw uh, Jeff McCabe, Jeff McCabe sitting right behind him, uh, building hoop houses to extend the growing season for farms. Stand up, Jeff. Can we got a couple other farmers in the room too. Please go ahead. Scott yep. Welser sitting next to me. Scott, what's your farm? Welser Farms. Oh. Uh, out of North Villanova. Somebody from Robin Hills Farm over here. All right. Say hi, Bill. Do people know about Robin Hills Farm yet? I mean, this is going to be another one awesome. of these big destination farms. It's amazing. I went out there this week, and I could not see so it. Like, you walk in, and you just go, as you tour the ground, and you just go, <laughs> 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 like that. Oh, it's awesome. You know, here, you guys are so back. Want to come on up to the seat, just to run through there. And, oh, everybody, you can't see if you got kind of a jam here, so down here. I would think once this place starts to grow, people learn about it, it's going to be it's going to be like one of those spots that everybody's going to know of, probably about and want to be involved. We're on the back. These are some of my students coming in, which you know, I think you have to give them a hand because it's the earliest they've been up. <laughs> <laughs> On the greenhouse uh, um, topic, I'll just say one thing we learned in that census comparison between 1950 and 2012, um, one of the highlights was that there's been a 50-fold increase of greenhouse uh, capacity in the county. Um, and we now have over uh, it's, uh, 1.5 million square feet of, of greenhouse capacity in the county, which when, you, when Kathy gets to her part and talks about the availability of produce year round, you know, that's part of the reason why. Um, and Steve Mangan is here from, uh, from U of M as the director of dining and has initiatives here about how to bring local dining into U of M as well. We're interested in buying, we just have to get through the transportation and aggregation piece. We don't need another truck on campus. <laughs> Great. You guys don't have time to drive to Ann Arbor either, so we need to figure that out. And, and as a good segue there, uh, Jay Gerhardt is here, uh, who has been retained by the county to work on food aggregation. Um, <laughs> As well. um, so, I, so when I think what's possible going forward, you know, you see kind of the, uh, we have enough in the room actually to create a whole ecosystem um, and do pretty well. So the question is, you know, that we had is, you know, what, what would happen if local food was way easier to buy? Um, what happened if we were able to take really the, the middlemen and some of the distribution, you know, out of the middle so that the farms could really get the, the economic benefit of their hard work growing your food. 
Um, so these are the questions that were going through our mind as we went to drop our son off, Ben, down at the College of Worcester in 2013. And uh, I'll give the mic to Kathy to continue the story. Kathy, can I just say, uh, I want to encourage people to uh, take video and tweet and things like that. Here, let me just say it. Well, uh, I, I, I don't know what to say, hashtag. I, I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> I think that's part of the farming community, isn't it? Hashtag. Uh, but what, what should we use as a hashtag? Uh, Leaders Connect, Connect Breakfast? Leaders Connect. Leaders Connect. So hashtag. So please feel free to take video, uh, film, uh, tweets, whatever you want to do, Facebook, and uh, be sure to get Kathy at that, right? But not me. That's why she's in the middle. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so um, now you've had the depressing part about what's happening, what's happened to our local ability to farm. And I, I think it's, there's such a bright future, and there are so many people engaged, as you can see, all the people that were pointed out. It's just, it's, I don't know, I feel really excited about the future of, of agriculture in this area. Bill didn't mention, and a lot of people don't know, that Michigan is the second most diverse state agriculturally in the nation. Second after California. Wow. Um, and it's, that's pretty amazing. We can grow vegetables, but we also have that fruit belt that is a blessing other people don't have. And we just took a drive on Southern California's Central Valley and saw the diversity of crops there, but it's all grown with water that is almost gone, literally almost gone. So it's an interesting thing that we're doing in this country. And I think we're getting to local food is gonna be not just in Ann Arbor, it's going to be everywhere. So getting back to Worcester, Ohio, this small town, we go down there, dropping our kid off, or we're looking at schools, and we wander into this little market. And it's a grocery store, but everything in there is local. And there are farmers dropping stuff off and curating their stuff. And the, my first thought, I remember, I just stood there and said, why doesn't every town in America have a store like this? Well, this is crazy. It was lovely. And uh, while we were there, we met a farmer dropping off eggs, and then he went to his truck and brought us a crate full of chicks that he just picked up in the mail from the post office, because that's how they come. Who knew? <laughs> and then the whole you know, store was gathered around his crate of little peeping chicks. And the blueberry lady explained how she'd grown her blueberries. And it was just, it was just an amazing experience. So we came back to Ann Arbor, and we thought, OK, let's start talking to people. And that's when we began doing more serious discussions. We just met with everybody we could. We went to the city of Ann Arbor, we talked to them about the local farmers market because it's so robust. You know, there's five Ann Arbor markets and then there's actually many more if you just go a little bit side out, outside of Ann Arbor. So we have a really big population that's interested in buying local. So we talked to everybody we could think of it. And I think we joke, we say, we were looking for somebody to tell us this is a really stupid idea and we should just stop. Or somebody who was saying, oh, we're already doing this. And then we would just say, oh, great, thanks, bye. <laughs> didn't happen. We, didn't, we had found a couple um, groups that had started looking at the concept but had not continued. So we persevered and we had enough encouragement from people like Brett Seabury or, you know, we, we met with... Um, a lot of farmers, and we said well, there has to be an outlet for them in this area. Kathy, guess what? Yeah. You want to tell the story about how at one point you thought about doing farming until you went well, to Brett's uh, farm? So what he actually had to so, do? Yeah, Bill didn't thank Brett and Barb, but we actually thought maybe we should be farmers, which was a very, would have been a bad idea. <laughs> and so we went to their farm, and we like milked goats and herded cows, and it did not take very long for us to realize that we did not you have A, the skill set, or B, the strength of character <laughs> to be farmers. So we really appreciated farmers even more after seeing what Brett and Barb do and all these farmers on a daily basis. So thank you, Brett, for <laughs> that. <laughs> um, so one thing about the Worcester store is that it's literally within viewing distance of their robust farmer's market. And since we're really big proponents of farmers markets and we think that they are a core uh, area of community in, in any city, that was important to us to see that they could operate this store, this market, right down the street from their farmers market. So I just want to make that point that it's an additive 
uh, the model is additive to the food economy, and it has been in Ann Arbor up to this point. So let me just make sure I'm doing my notes. Um, so this is when we were talking about, should we do something together with our careers? You know, we, we've been kind of circling the wagons, and then we just decided to just do it. And um, we found a location, and it was, you know, a, a abandoned gas station. We don't have any retail experience. That didn't stop us. Uh, our daughter worked for Bob Sparrow for three years, so we thought maybe that's enough to <laughs> help us. Um, she didn't warn us off, but she was a core part of the startup team. So, um, so here we are. It's two and a half years since we saw the place in Worcester, and Argus Farm Stop has been in business for a year and no, a year and six months, right? So we'll be at our second year anniversary in August. So I want to give you some of the statistics that we, you know, from starting the business. So. We are an L3C, which is a low-profit, limited liability corporation. That is a for-profit corporation with a social mission. So it just allows us access to some funds that um, a regular LLC might not be um, accessing. So L3C. But we do have this social mission of keeping community engagement, which is really, if you come to Argus, you know, because it's so tiny that you can't not be engaged with your community. Our first full year sales, calendar year sales, were $1.3 million. Oh and of that, over a million um, was locally farmed goods. We have a cafe, for those of you who've been there, that's like the little engine that runs the train. So we have a cafe with pastries. And that starts the sense of community. It keeps the farmers standing around with a honey latte, talking to customers. and. Uh, but you know, over a million dollars adding to the local food economy is no small event to us. When you look at the farmers markets, like you know, the Ipsy market does three hundred thousand dollars. That's huge. And so, if you think every market does that much money, uh, get gets it back into the hands of farmers, it's really critical to have markets that that get it back into the pockets of farmers at a rate that they can continue to farm with. So. We're 80-20, the farmer sets the price, so Brett Seabury puts his price, he tells us, I want my ground beef to be this price. Oh yeah, I brought one. Our meat's frozen because that's what we have to do as a farmer's market, but it's great. So there's a package of Brett Seabury's <laughs> frozen beef. Um, that will be dinner. Right. He, so he sets the price, he might change it, depending on what the market's bearing. But we know how he grew that cow, we know how many cows he has, we know how often. We actually, we're the, you know, we know. So we can tell customers, for every one of our farmers, and our entire staff will do that. So if you would ask, you know, how much, we have customers who ask questions like, how much room does the chicken have? And is, where is, you know, which is a great question, because one minute he might have a lot of room, and the next minute he might be like, right up next to his buddy. So we, we answer a lot of questions about the individual growing practices, and we generally stick to uh, people who grow naturally and uh, don't need to be certified organic, but we have a lot of certified organic suppliers in our store. So, 80% goes to Brett, 20% goes to us to run the store, and that's worked. We, are, we have over 15 employees. We follow the Zingerman's model. We pay them a good starting wage. We pay health care for our full-time employees. We, we are trying to do this the right way, and we feel really good about what we've been able to do. All right, so um, what else? Our top 20 producers in our store, each of our top 20 producers, when we average those 20, they, um, the amount of revenue they get from us is over $25,000, $26,000. That's a big bump for them over their CSAs and their farmers markets. You can have 20 farmers doing that, so that means that we get some farmers in the $50,000 range, right? That's a big bump for them over what they were doing before. We ran at break even our first year, so we are sustainable economically. Pricing is consistent with local farmers markets. We do price checks. We send our staff out to check the local grocery stores because you know our store looks a little boutiquey. So we, you know, you might think it's uh, a higher priced site. It's not. Customers are always amazed at the pricing of our products. So we're really happy about that. We take food assistance, SNAP, and we hope to be doing double up food bucks this year. We don't we haven't heard yet, but 
So we were trying to encourage access to all kinds of populations right on the bus line, so that's really great. Okay, now I just want to do two minutes on the fun part of this deal, which is, so you saw Brett's beef, but like, anybody know what these are? Ramps. Right, ramps, we have ramps, we have forage products. I mean, I wish you guys could be there when like some guy in a pickup truck pulls up in the parking lot and is like, well, can I speak to the owner? And then you know that there's some good mushrooms in the back of that truck. <laughs> my colleagists and our staff so we you know do the right thing because you know it's mushrooms <laughs> so this cute little head of lettuce was grown by a new farmer on Tillian Farm Development Center which is a locally uh, a local farm development organization that encourages new farmers so there's a plot out on Pontiac Trail you should all go visit Tillian it is a wonderful experience to meet these new not always super young farmers. Yeah, compared to me, yes, but um, new farmers growing a variety of things, including chickens. Um, let's see what else. We got breakfast turnips, like little little baby turnips. So everything that we have is so, I mean, you can't feel this stuff. I, I'll pass this around if you want, but it's so fresh and it's, it's so fun to have produce that's hasn't been sitting in a big truck on the way across the country. It makes a huge difference in everything that we do. So I want to make that point and then, oh, and then Bill wanted me to talk about fish because we have a wide variety of fish from the Great Lakes through a couple of fish companies, Bayport Fish Company. It's low, you know, so it's grown, or it lives in Michigan till they catch it. <laughs> And then we have shrimp from Okemos. So there are saltwater tanks in Okemos that this guy is growing shrimp because he saw how unsustainably shrimp is often harvested in other countries. So he wanted an alternative and he's doing it and it's a fabulous product. So to end what we're gonna talk about with our guests is, I just, you know, our, the question is, is it sustainable, is it working? Are we having an impact? Are we growing the local food economy? And the answer is yes. Okay, and with that, help other people open this type of model. Uh, we we just wanna, don't want to be involved in the operations, but we're happy to help. We can give you all the you know financials and the setup details. You can come work with us. Uh, Kiki and Rohani have come and spent many, many hours at Argus to learn the model before they decided to open the farmer's hand. It's, so we want people to come to us and we'll teach them how to do it. So it's an open source model. And now here's Alex. Um, so yes, I'm Alex and I helped to build the roadhouse. Um, I actually grew up in Northern California, but my wife is from here. And so we moved here almost 15 years ago now with the thought of opening a, a restaurant. Um, at that time, I was actually the only corporate executive chef on the staff for Hilton Hotels nationally. And so there was several food and beverage vice VPs, but I was the only chef in charge of three and a half billion of food and beverage. So, that's a lot of money and a lot of food. Much of it not very good. <laughs> but we built the roadhouse here with Paul and Ari and their model of having managing partners at each site. And it's been one heck of a road. I did not set out to build a restaurant like this. I did set out to build a really great American restaurant. And uh, in doing that, we, we started out at about two and a quarter million first year lost a huge amount of money. <laughs> um, sometimes I feel like a nonprofit, but <laughs> this year we'll top nine million dollars of sales. And so that's about it's somewhere in the neighborhood of a three million dollar food purchase. And uh, we are a regional American restaurant, so we do buy food from all over the country. Um, it's almost all American food. Yeah. It's almost no imports. But um, the, uh, the food that we buy for us has to be full flavored and has to be growing really well 
in order to be, we always select food based upon its flavor and what we're seeking. So we do in fact buy food from all over the place, but over the years we've transitioned all of our, almost all of our meat is coming from within a couple of hundred miles. We do still buy ribs that get shipped from Nyman Ranch, which is in California, and slaughtered in Sioux City. Um, a lot of the ribs, that's one of our biggest sellers, so that's hard to get locally because a pig only has two ribs on it. <laughs> but uh, we were open less than a year, and I wanted a hobby, and so I started gardening tomatoes, and tomatoes have been something that, um, that I've fallen in love with growing here when open pollinated tomatoes and we grew a lot of them and then I realized that I kind of liked farming because it's a lot like uh, cooking making food and so I started I started to uh, uh, thank you Tim I started to uh, think about what else we could grow and I fell on um, roasted heirloom um, Italian red peppers because we were buying imported peppers from Greece at the time and so I thought well let's grow all of the peppers that we use here at the roadhouse and that was really the start of our farm our farm actually contributes somewhere in the neighborhood of six to seven percent of our food purchase. So it's a very small amount of our food purchase. Um, but helps me to learn about food and what really good farms are about. And so that's why I pursue that. Um, I mean, growing some animals, because we, use a, we cook a lot of meat here at the Roadhouse, it seemed that the meat agricultural industry in this nation is, is more destructive than any other that I can think of. So I thought it really important for us to buy the best meat that we could. And when we think about um, business, and we think about um, food people that we work with, one of our criteria is really how is, how is the business run? And so for us, we are never paying our people enough money, so it's part of our mission to increase wages, and so that's a really important part of what we do, and also to buy the best food that we can find. And so those things all put us at a disadvantage with the competition, because typically in restaurants, um, you're buying the cheapest food that you can buy, and you're paying people as little as you can pay them. And so for us, um, we're constantly in that battle of trying to what the market will bear in terms of how much we can charge and still stay alive. And that in turn equates to how much we can pay our people that work here. It's an interesting business model. And we are in fact open book as well. So if you come here on a Wednesday morning, I'd be happy to, to show you our numbers from start to finish. I don't know what else I could tell you, Ralph. Part of what I want to say uh, is in terms of building a local economy, it's also uh, providing jobs. And I want to thank Mandy, who's uh, actually part of your staff, and I almost feel like she's part of my staff as well. And let's all give Mandy a great hand. Mandy's been with us from the very start. She lived for a few years, but uh, we're glad you're back. And so uh, I think that that's the other thing is the education of your staff in terms of what they are able to teach customers about food, and that's really great. So uh, I had a conversation, Alex and uh, uh, Kathy and Bill did not really know each other other than by sight, so we sat down for breakfast uh, a few weeks ago to plan for this, and I was really amazed at uh, what I was learning about uh, some of the uh, problems that are related in our society to food. I wonder if you could uh, elaborate on that a little bit, Alex, in terms of some of the work you're doing in, in, with the federal government in Washington and things about diabetes and what a uh, problem that is and how it's related to food. Um, well, I'm a member of the Chefs Action Network, which is a group of chefs from around the country. There's about several hundred of us now, but I'm one of the founding chefs, and we go to D.C. a few times a year to fight for food reform. And so the way I see it is that really poor farming, commodity corn, commodity um, soybeans are generally processed not for food, they're for um, other things. And that, that is really a core issue in our country um, and or animal feed. And that's really a core issue. But the highly processed food creating really ill health effects for our nation is probably, in my opinion, the largest 
problem in, in food and society today. And so we, um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's contributing to, to um, diabetes and obesity is highly contributing to our, our budget deficits because the plan increases are responsible for almost 40% of our plan budget deficits going forward. And so fighting that is really maybe the single most important thing, I think, in our nation at this point in time. If we could just see some improvement, some drop in those forecasted numbers, it would really change the entire nation's financial outlook. Um, but local jobs, local food, more food, more farms, better. Yeah. Do you want to add anything to that about the health aspects of this? Um, so I'd say we've kind of impacted the local neighborhood where we have the store, and we've seen a change in people's shopping habits. Um, uh, even people who didn't, some people seek us out because they know what we're all about. Other people just happen to come in there because we look like a grocery store. Um, but it's been nice to see them transition to a, you know, buying, uh, you know, I guess smaller amounts more frequently of what's fresh. And, you know, when their kids are starting to eat fresh stuff, all of a sudden, you know, um, tomatoes are amazing instead of gross. Or, uh, you know, it's, so, it, you know, I think that having good food in front of kids growing up has been uh, something as well that uh, makes a major difference in their long-term health. We have a kid food basket sometimes where we just put random stuff in, like raw vegetables, and it's free kid food. It just, all it says is free kid food. And you'll see these kids like walk up to it and look, and, and then with 10 minutes later, I'll look back at the basket and there'll be a bite out of like three of <laughs> want to try stuff so you have to monitor the basket pretty well but but that was a, one of our employees ideas like find a way to get kids because there's always kids walking around and everything's at eye level give them something to try so when i can see a kid taking a bite of a, a purple carrot and then you know being showing their mom that their teeth are purple that's awesome so, so the uh different ways that this has impacted the community. Um, I remember I've been coming to Ann Arbor since the, well, probably since the 50s. And when I started in school here in the mid 60s, uh, I drive from Old Park and uh, once you hit Northville, all the way to Ann Arbor, there was nothing but farm. And there was no 275, no M14. Uh, and then the same thing going north, south, east, east and west. So I wonder, could you, somebody comment about how much of the farmland has been lost in the state, uh, what, what that means for us that this farmland has lost? Maybe Barry. Barry, Barry, Barry can you this. talk about that? Come on up, Barry. Or, he, or stand up. Or just stand up, yeah. Probably better just come up because we're, we're recording this. Uh, I didn't mention Roger Rail, who's one of our sponsors that puts all this on YouTube. Barry, can you tell Tell us what you do and also talk about the land usage and uh, try to help with it. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, Barry Lonick is my name. I started the Legacy Land Conservancy 25 years ago this year, actually, wow. um, which is now a thriving nonprofit organization. And then <clears throat> shortly after that, started to um, go before uh, elected boards of representatives, uh, county board of commissioners, township boards, and so forth to get um, proposals on local ballots to fund the preservation of farmland. So many times I heard that there were farmers in particular who said, I don't want to see my land get developed, but I really can't afford to give it away or give away my right to sell it off to a developer. And the way to get around that is to be able to offer them compensation for the value of the rights that they have in their land to divide it up into smaller parcels. <coughs> And so we've been running these ballot program, uh, ballot campaigns since, well, 1998 was the first one. Unfortunately, we lost that one. But then we've won every one since then. And I think we've generated something on the order of $160 million of funds just in this community, in, in Washtenaw County, to be able to preserve land, either natural areas or um, farmland preservation. And so there's five funded programs here now in Washtenaw County. Uh, one's run by Washtenaw County Parks. Um, there's the Anna Greenbelt program, which can actually expend money outside of the city limits to buy land and, and conservation easements. Um, and then also, uh, in my job, is to operate the three township level programs 
um, that also have their own dedicated villages, which is Ann Arbor Township, north of the city, South Township, just to the west of us here, and then Webster Township, north of that. And through all these combined efforts, the conservancies, the locally funded programs, and so forth, um, we're now over 11,000 acres of just farmland that's been preserved um, here in Washington County. Great. Far, what percentage of the land was farmland let's, you know, in the last 10, 20 years, what it is, how, it, how it's shrinking, and you have that data? Not off the top of my head, man. Okay. Um, <laughs> Bill's, I've got, got, I've got some. Bill's got some. It's the, the agricultural census that's, that's uh, done by the U.S. Department of Agriculture every five years? Yeah. yeah. Um, can show you that data. Um, in 2012, I think, is the most recent. Um, study of that. I did track that for quite a number of years in making the arguments about why we needed to have a farmland preservation program here in the county. And I know that uh, there was a time when we were first starting these campaigns that we said there was, oh God, it was like uh, tens of thousands of acres a year were being lost um, from agricultural production into something else, usually housing developments. Um, and that was part of our argument for saying, you know, we need, to, we need to stop this hemorrhaging right now. And this is long before we even had some of the locally uh, grown uh, produce uh, farms that came online. We just were looking ahead and saying, we don't want to keep importing uh, food from Venezuela or California or Israel or wherever. We want to grow it locally here, but we got to have land to do that. Um, and eventually we succeeded. We're, we're very fortunate to live in a community that has smart people and have voted time and time again to tax themselves um, to fund these land preservation programs. So thank you all for that. I want to thank Mary. Mary's one of these uh, unsung heroes in our community. We don't, we don't know about Mary. He's not out there on the sports pages. Uh, unless, I'm, unless I'm missing something, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, he, he is uh, somebody really dedicated. There's many people in this room that have really been on a mission uh, to try to make us all healthier and the land healthier. So thank you very much. So, so we, got, we got together, uh, we were talking about um, why is agriculture such a, a big deal? And I, I work with MEDC, Michigan Economic Development Corporation, and everybody's always looking for a second industry besides uh, auto to, to sustain the state. Why should we be thinking more about agriculture as an industry in that regard? Is Bill? Well, <clears throat> so I can answer that question um, by talking about beer for a moment. Um, you know, how many people here really appreciate the variety of awesome local beers that we have now? Um, how, how many people remember what it was like in, in the 1980s, you know, trying to find a good beer uh, when your choice was Budweiser? Budweiser, uh, Schlitz. <laughs> there's, I mean, there's some Atlas, Atlas. But so what's happened in beer, you know, over this time period, I think sets a paradigm of what's possible with local food. Um, with beer, it was a change in legislation that allowed home brewing in 1978, and then in the 90s, for the first time, allowed people to sell and, and, uh, directly to consumers. Remember, with food, we talked about how important selling directly to consumers is. It's the economics that makes all of the startups possible. And so the first, in the 80s, there were three brew pubs in the nation, three. Um, now there are thousands. Um, and it all has to do with the legislation changes that made it possible to sell direct to consumers. That inspired a whole set of people now to go into business and be very creative. And it's over $130, $40 million industry for Michigan now. We're one of the leading uh, states in the country for, for microbrews in, 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 in the beer industry. Um, when I look at food, I, I see the same kind of possibility. Um, Kathy mentioned that the climate of Michigan is unique. So um, we have this, the, the second highest diversity of what's possible to be grown here. Uh, with the greenhouse space, you're extending the growing seasons to almost year round for most things. Um, and I think it is possible that the that this could become and continue to be, and again, you know, with leadership culinary-wise, Zingerman's Roadhouse, others, this can become a real food destination um, that we have natural advantages compared to other states, other parts of the world, that lets us potentially fill that role. So I'm pretty enthusiastic about the possibility of food being a big part of Michigan's future. 
And I want to make one follow-on comment to that, because I just recently learned this. So Michigan has all these laws that are designed to protect consumers um, in food areas. And I think, having looked into them, I'm convinced that many of them were written to protect the big food companies from the small food companies. And I want to give a shout out to Amanda Edmonds, who isn't here. She oh, yeah. here. Growing Hope, and Amanda was instrumental in getting the state to change regulations that allowed individuals to sell their products at farmers markets. It's called the Cottage Food Law, and anybody who has tried to like start a business without going into it with a huge commercial kitchen can understand that you should be allowed to sell your stuff to the consumer uh, in a in a way that. Um, that helps you grow and encourages others to enter those markets because that's where the employment comes from. So Amanda worked with the state to actually create the cottage food law that allowed that. I, that is like a huge thing and I she had no idea that she was involved in that. But yeah. second careers like you folks did a few years ago um, and I, I, when I was having breakfast with you guys Alex said something like oh you know it's a great business opportunity here and I'm like, what is that you said, could you tell me what you said Alex you remember about the slaughterhouse <laughs> well it's a tremendous opportunity or need in this in this community or region is to have more slaughterhouses um, my father-in-law tells me not 30, 40 years ago, there was two in Dexter, there was three or four in Ann Arbor, et cetera, et cetera. And it's one of the big barriers to the Roadhouse actually buying all of its meat from this county is that there is not a slaughterhouse that's USDA approved for a long ways. We travel an hour, 15 minutes each way to go to Union City and have meat brought to us from there, or we drive two hours and five minutes to Yale, which is ridiculous when you're hauling just a handful of animals. Um, just adds exponential cost and so we buy some meat very locally but a lot of it comes just from northern Ohio the vast majority of our beef and again like I mentioned when we opened all of that stuff came from the west coast so we brought that a lot more local but if there was just a larger local slaughterhouse in this county it would enable I believe many farmers to do a lot more production and to sell to chefs like myself at a more competitive price. Um, are there any other uh, business needs that people who are thinking about getting into the business might, might consider? I know Jeff Cave is doing the hoops, yep. help people grow uh, indoors. Uh, what else is... Uh, well, it's my, opinion, it's my opinion that the grain processing is a big hole in the larger market um, because so much of the local farmland is used to grow commodities like we talked about earlier and that's because the infrastructure to process it and sell it is there. Obviously government subsidies and whatnot are involved also. But if there was a lot more acreage being used for large scale grains that was better food and grown organically, because field crops are not particularly difficult to grow organically compared to produce which takes a lot of hands and a lot of work um, to grow organically, um, I think that would make a tremendous difference. I mean, we have some of the largest cereal plants in the country or the world in our state, and a lot of that stuff is not growing as nearly as well as it could be. It's interesting, I was thinking about if you think about the grain belt, and you go just across the street, you go to Battle Creek, and then you come to Jiffy, Jiffy Mix, and uh, you know, just, there's, there's a lot right here, a lot of food produced with grains. Uh, same with uh, other products like uh, cherries everywhere, you know, the berries. Uh, and now I see more wine going. But none of that stuff is grown organic. That's not their criteria. Yeah. And that is a tremendous difference to, it's a tremendous difference to the health of, of the population. Yeah. Could you, could you yeah, speak to that? that? Is that, we were yeah, talking about this way. Hold on just one second. Right. But just, uh, I think there's a, oh, we, you're seeing debates about organic. Could you guys give your opinions about that? Why it really is that important? Well, the use of Roundup is is <laughs> tremendously bad. It's Agent Orange. Yeah, isn't that That's wonderful? What we dropped on Vietnam, right? Let's kill ourselves by spraying the rest of our food with it. It's a great idea. 
I think you guys want to comment on the organic yeah. controversy? Well, yeah, to me, organic practices are important. Organic certification is a hurdle for farmers because it can cost thousands of dollars to be certified organic. But growing organically is better for the soil in the long run. And there are many ways to learn about how good growing biologically or dynamically or organically or naturally, whatever you want to call it, how it restores the soil. We've depleted our soils. And the, and the other thing is, look at what they're saying about the bees. You know, the use of Roundup and neonicotinoids for, um, as herbicides, that it's really compromising our ability to even pollinate the stuff that we have. And if, and you, if you look into this, it's a really big deal. So it's not just that the food tastes better and there's not residue on the product, but it's the way everything works in the whole ecosystem in yeah. the soil. Well, oh, and a lot of field crops are actually sprayed with Roundup to kill them so they'll ripen and be harvested. And so they're being sprayed right before they're being harvested in many cases, which is just unbelievable. And the soil destruction is, is obviously, I think, almost equally as big of a deal, big deal because once the micronutrients are gone from the soil, and then, what's it take, 100 years to build an inch of topsoil, something like that, and then we're just letting it get eroded. Um, in conventional modern farming techniques. Do you also comment on the uh, on climate change? I mean, I read an article yesterday about farmers in Africa. Did you read that? And it was about, uh, it might have been Zambia, but uh, I've spent some time in Africa, but the drought uh, has been so severe that it's caused, when they go to these towns, these really remote towns in, in Africa, they, they find something missing, men. And the reason is all the men were farmers and could not grow anymore because of the drought. And now they are part of the migration, which is causing problems all over the world. And so, you know, everything is, is grown, think locally, but, you know, I think grow locally, but grow locally, buy locally. Uh, I wonder if you guys could comment on what, what this is going to mean for Michigan uh, in terms of, uh, is it, a, I hate to say it, but is it an opportunity? Are we going to be in a better position? Uh, is it going to be worse for us? Uh, and what are some of the implications about uh, global, global climate change? What, what does Michigan have that no, else, no other place in the world has? Water. So somebody made an argument to me recently that I thought was pretty profound, which is, we're not doing anything with our water. It's going to be easy for Nestle to come in or somebody to, you know, to make the argument that, well, we can do something with your water. And agriculture is a great thing to do with water, right? And we have, a, I mean, go to South Lyon. Half that city is like underwater. There's a lot of water around Michigan. I, and, I, and I love to see that. But I, I think, wow, we're just not purposing it. And, and, a, lot, and a lot of great farmland. A lot of great farmland. So, you know, you just have to look around you and say, we have the resources, why are we not using them effectively? So I would say water, but and that's just, somebody mentioned that to me the other day and I thought, well, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Use it, and then you can preserve it. And when we're just having gone to California and seen, they're still planting olive groves, brand new olive groves in a desert. And I'm like, why are they planting those there? I'll stop. Okay. <laughs> Can I ask, uh, Brett, see, Brett, Brett, if you would come up, please. I'd love to have Brett? you. Brett? Oh, sorry, Brett. Come on up. Can, can I do it from here? No, no you're loud. I want you to join the conversation. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, I, I was just going to say, when I think about climate change, and, you know, what's happening in California is likely to happen more frequently. And, um, you know, the whole food system right now grew up after World War II. Um, and it's dependent on fossil fuels. And right now, we don't really feel any pressure at all. Gas is at an all-time low, uh, just about. Um, the issue is with, with fossil fuels is that the interruption can be abrupt. And so, you know, if something does happen, it'll normally happen like it did in the 70s. And so it's just, in general, it's, I'm not like alarmist, but I feel like, wow, you'd hate to have something happen and then you completely ignored your whole farming community. You know, so for a lot of good reasons, and I'd put, you know, climate change, you know, is, is one of them maybe in the middle of the list, but it's definitely a good reason to have not abandoned your farming and to invest in, in what can be grown here. 
Brett, I wanted to have you come up. Uh, Brett, Brett's an old friend of mine. Uh, probably known each other for a good 30 years or so. And uh, you're the first person I know that did your own farm. And I know you have a lot of, uh, Brett also was a professor. Uh, you still are, I guess. No. No, no you left. You're not, a, no, that's not one of those emeritus guys or anything? I'm emeritus only in the bottom of the hoop. OK. <laughs> but he was a, a farmer a, Brett. No, farmer farmer Brett, Brett. Brett. Professor Farmer Brett. <laughs> no. Farmer <laughs> Professor Brett. <laughs> Brett. But Brett was uh, an esteemed professor at the School of Social Work uh, for many years and uh, a real thought leader on social work and now he's become a thought leader about food. So I just wonder if you could share some of your experience and maybe give us some of uh, ideas about the local food economy from your perspective. And I don't know something else that you're very focused on is practice. Maybe that comment on that. We're going to get ourselves in a lot of trouble here. <laughs> way out, you know. Um, I wouldn't call you up if I didn't want trouble. Right? Okay. <laughs> I'll be very uh, quick about what we try to do on Golden Fleece Farms. We want to produce healthy food. We don't want all the crap that's in the food you eat now. So we don't put any kind of herbicides, pesticides, fungicides. You can't imagine the materials that get placed on the soil. And you mentioned the issue of someone about spraying glyphosate on a mature crop. So if you've ever grown wheat, and we have, we don't grow it anymore, that's a monocrop, it's not good for the soil. But they spray durum wheat, which is grown throughout the Midwest, when it's just about ready to harvest. And if you've ever looked at the top of a wheat, it's that little, all those little berries, those are dry. So when it's sprayed with glyphosate, the glyphosate is going into a, a dry kernel. So it's right. Now, Monsanto doesn't want you to know this, okay? <laughs> but that's, that's a poison. And now there was a recent study I read that said now they're finding glyphosate everywhere. So if there's one thing you need to be aware of, don't buy any bread, because the basis of bread is durum wheat. You've got to buy organic. I mean, we only, my wife makes her own bread, and she only buys organic bread. Uh, you know, flour. Thank you for the you know, senior moment here. <laughs> um, so we also are into sustainability which is the most difficult thing in the world, I have to tell you, to have a sustainable farm. Uh, we have a windmill, we have solar array, and we have geotherm to heat, and we still don't have our carbon footprint at zero. I still have to buy diesel fuel for my tractors. I still use tractors to do things, bale hay. Um, the basis of our sustainability is our cattle. Our 50 cattle, mothers, who would walk all over the farm in what's called intensive grazing. They are the mechanism for increasing the value of our soil. In fact, I will often say to people when they ask what do you do, I'll say I'm a dirt farmer. And they think of what that means from maybe the 1930s. That is what we do. We spend all our time worrying about that dirt. Because if we don't take care of that, we don't get the pastures we need to feed our cattle. And the cat, I mean, it's all tied to that dirt. Um, what else can I say? Could you uh, one comment about what, do you, what is the, there's many business people here, bankers, whatever, what, what is needed in the business community from your perspective locally to bolster organic <laughs> grain <laughs> process? No, well, I, we, need, we need a USDA yeah. butchering facility, absolutely. And, and I know okay. there's some efforts to do that. I hope they go through here in Washtenaw County. I know the, some of the people involved in that. I sure hope that we can do a lot of business together. Okay. But I, I don't want to talk about bankers, or banksters, as I call them. <laughs> <laughs> How about the, the, the nation, the nationals? Well, I worry about. Okay, we won't talk, <laughs> we won't talk about banksters. I'm sure there are some good ones somewhere. Okay. There's a good one right there. There is. Okay. All right. I, have I made a fool of myself? No, no. Okay. Can you actually? I want you to talk about. Today's an academic freedom. Right. From a farmer's perspective, models like Argus. 
Well, how does that impact you? Uh, I'll tell you how it impacts us. We, uh, we can't produce enough because it's increased our ability to sell our beef and lamb and those products. In fact, uh, we did the taboo thing. We're going to run out of meat. Yeah, I know we're not supposed to do that. But the problem with grass-fed beef is you can't butcher them until they've been on grass for a while. Because they've been eating hay. That's all they get, and minerals in the wintertime. So um, the impact is I think it's probably put us into a tax bracket where we have to pay income tax. <laughs> $15,000, which I realize isn't a huge amount of income, but when you're balancing your farm and you're completely retired, that's a huge uh, addition to our income. The other question I have for you, because you've got to get rid of this hunk of meat, where is it? <laughs> this. That's my dinner. Oh, that's your dinner? Oh, I'm, I'm going to, see you brought me up here, I'm going to cause trouble. No, yeah. Argus is the greatest thing that ever happened to our farm. I, I want you to know. Okay. Here's a question from the farmer. This is the farmer's question. How long did it take to make this pound of meat? Grass fed meat. How long? In months. Now, if you're a farmer, you already know, so I'm not going to look at what you're doing. How long did it take, just so you can appreciate the, the work that we do in producing. Here it is, there it is. What? Eight months. Eight months, huh, not even close. Four years. Say again? 36 months. Oh, you're very close. Actually, it's 33. Because, uh, now, 36 is probably close to an average. And why is that? Why do you say three years? I grow the time. What, no, why does it take three, almost three years to raise them? So you, you, you need to have contact with your farmer to know. This, this took three, almost three years to, to, make, to produce. Well, first of all, you've got to have a bull. And the bull has to fornicate with the cow. How long, how long does that take? It's very quick, <laughs> but it's about two months to be sure that the cow is bred. She carries the fetus and calf for another nine months. So there's almost a year before we see the calf. Then it's two more years of feeding that calf. So it's three years to produce that. Um, and people which, often, go ahead. Which none of, it would be artificially inseminated in conventional farming. And then it would all of this and then it would be growing maybe a year right to 800 pounds or so in, in, in a, in a well, food lot. Well in a food lot they right. can do it faster. Right that's what I'm saying it'll be under a year a whole cycle in, in, a, in a feedlot scenario it'll be so much less uh, nutritious and so much less healthful. No, it's gonna, it'll by be, the way we can, can be grown it organically and it can be intercropped and in fact, polycropping is the whole thing now that's, that's very interesting for uh, the nutrition density of grains. Did you say what that is? Uh, multiple crops grown in the same plot at the same time. And so like, you can grow wheat with an understory of, of good white clover and do it organically. And it can be grown in smaller plots so that they're 10 and 20 acre plots instead of 500 acre plots. And that way, we can still have really good grains, but they do have to be rotated properly. So we have to have the market for the other rotations in order for them to be grown well. And it is possible, it's being done in small plots and in various places. And if you go to Italy, they don't have 5,000 acres of one thing. I want to ask you, and Brett, one other question. That yeah. is about, uh, it's about man and woman power. I mean, yeah. you, you have farms, and I know you're, uh, you know, getting up there and uh, you past 50 at this point, I believe. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's 60. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and but how do you bring, how do we bring young people into farming. I mean, because it's a very labor intense uh, work and it's not work that I think people are, are being drawn to and actually being drawn away from. So I guess I asked both of you that question. What about employment opportunities? Well, the 
problem starts way back with farm bills and subsidies because the commodity conventional farmers are at a tremendous advantage over us small guys that have to do a lot more labor and everything. I mean, the amount of, if you're going to have that cow on land for three years instead of less than one year, it costs money, costs time, costs food. I'd be feeding it for that much longer every single day they have to be tended. I mean, it's, it's an economic issue, I think, essentially. So it has to be, we have to find a way to make it more interesting and rewarding for young farmers. Um, food is too cheap in this country, but you can't really tell a family of four trying to survive on 18 or, or less thousand dollars a year that food is too cheap. It's a pretty complex problem. Farming is a mental disability. Uh, it's, it should be on, for those of you that know the DSM Diagnostic and Statistic Manual, you know there are these categories of mental illness. Farmer, there's one. Well, the farmers should be on it. It should be on, it. Should be on it. the mention too, which we see the narcissistic personality dramatically demonstrated in our political system now. But there should be, there should be farmer. Because people have no reason to go into farming. It is not a good economic choice. It is used to be the most dangerous profession, but now I guess running gas stations late at night is the most dangerous. <laughs> and uh, I mean, there are just many reasons. And most of the farmers I know, including us, had, uh, and farmers have other jobs. Right. They have other jobs, not because they want those other jobs, yeah. but it allows them to farm. And uh, I'm very much impressed with all the young people. I just worry about when they start to have kids and they have to pay bills, how they survive economically. They got to get that job in the community. Um, all right. Can I? Can I? You sit down. down. Oh, right. So should we bring up some of the other uh, food people that have, we have, I'd like to have, expand the conversation a little bit. Uh, come on up if you want to join us. I don't want to call you out because some people may not like that, but uh, Jeff, uh, Rahini, you want to come up or uh, whoever is part of this world and you can introduce you a little bit more and uh, talk about how this all works together. This is about the local food economy ecosystem. So, Roger, would we spread out this way? Is this good? Yeah. yeah. So we got all this on video, so if you could just take the seats here. And you guys can stay around. Bill, uh, hey Bill, why don't, Bill, why don't you lead this part of the conversation? You know these folks, maybe you can just uh, ask them a little bit what they're doing and talk about how all this fits together from your perspective. Would you mind? Sure. You know, I think we could actually just kind of uh, spend some time walking through uh, and kind of more introducing what you've been working on and, and I have a, more of a chance to talk about um, some of the initiatives that you think are important. I think one of the themes that we want to pull out today is what's the barrier that's preventing more local food from, from happening in your perspective? Um, so I'll start. Passing the mic here. Okay. You maybe say who you are too. And uh, I'm Karen Drakes. Again, Sleepy Cricket Healthy Vending. Um, I want to request a proposal with Washtenaw County to provide healthy vending in county buildings and facilities. And the biggest challenge is the county created guidelines that are some of the most rigorous in the country, which I'm all for. That's why I got into this business. But the biggest challenge is trying to find locally manufactured or, or produced products that I can put into the machines. When I approached um, meat purveyors. They don't have the USDA certification to be able to provide preserved meats in plastic as opposed to having them refrigerated. I tried to talk to CARS or, or um, Germac about packaging nuts and single servings that were low sodium. They're willing to sell me a barrel, but they can't sell me a one, one and a half ounce serving. It's, it's a huge challenge and something that the, the demand for healthy foods is surpassing the supply dramatically. Um, and fortunately, Zingerman's stepped up to the plate. I actually have little bitty Zingerman's candy bars that I can put in. And while you may be wondering why Zingerman's candy bars are nutritious, it's, it's about portion control. It's, it's less than 200 calories, and it's all organic and freshly prepared and not loaded with preservatives. So 
compared to a Milky Way, it's a great thing. But that's the biggest challenge I face is, is getting people who work locally, grow locally, or um, produce locally to create small servings of uh, great organic, minimally processed foods. Great, thank you. So I'm Jeff McCabe, and uh, people mentioned that I built greenhouses, hoop houses for a lot of the farmers, including the uh, Cornman farm just recently. Um, started off, uh, I, I think, I want to steer, eventually steer this back to like the future of the food, of the model that you guys are doing, because I think there's so many ways like you fell in love with what was going on. I feel like I fell in love with that and it changed some of my lives, and I think your store, that model, really can do that for so many people. I'd love to hear where you're going with that. Um, I think that happened with me. With Tom Becker was a person who was super key for me, just falling in love with this guy who wanted to come here to this county and grow food and start this farm. And I did a lot of things that kind of turned my life upside down in certain ways to support that. Did a little project called Selma Cafe and helped start Tillian Farm Development Center. But I think the, the thing that I'd be remiss not to mention is just this, these two communities coming together. Thank you, uh, Rob, for, for, for doing this, for bringing these together with people that are in banking, and business, I want to just emphasize how big I think this win can be. You know, not only is it this billion dollar food system that we are just in this little county, a billion dollars, we heard, you know, millions of dollars in these businesses. You know, it adds up to something, you know, $15,000 here and there, you know, getting into Brett's pocket is a billion dollar win that we could have here. And not only just that, like relocalizing a lot of that, but we've, you know, farm policy in this country has led us to this place where we're just growing these corn and soybeans. And you talked about beer, you know, that's one where I think again and again we can look to Europe. It's kind of, I feel bad always having to do this. Like, why can't we do this? Why don't we have something that's like prosciutto, you know, or whatever. We've come, we'll come up with these names for what we do here eventually, you know. But we have to like look at that and see beer, terroir, you know, beer, local flavor, these things survive you know, in Europe, and now we figured out how to bring that back. And, and we've lost all that opportunity with food, too. We could have, you know, a region, a food region, something that people come to, tourism, you know, all that kind of stuff is, there's just this huge win that we could have. So I just really want, you know, everybody to get that. It's not just, you know, fun. You know there's so many places for the win to happen. And to build a lot of jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, everybody, uh, here can be part of that, you know, blowing that wind, uh, creating that wind that, uh, that uh, becomes strong. I'm Tim Redmond, and I started out my, uh, graduated from U of M a long time ago, and I uh, was one of the founders of Eden Foods, so I've been in the organic food industry for a long, long time, about 45 years now. And, uh, now I'm a partner in a uh, small... My old partner, Mike Potter, is still running that, and uh, you know, thankfully he has not sold that company, he's still running it. Eden's a good company, down in uh, Tecumseh now, or Tecumseh, Clinton actually, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, uh, I am a partner in a local company called Eat Local, Eat Natural. We pick up at small farms like Brett's, and uh, these are farmers who can't get to the market, or don't want to, or um, and we deliver to places like the Roadhouse and, and a lot of other restaurants around Detroit and here. And anyway, I, I got up here because I wanted to say this, that every, everyone here is an eater of food. And eating, as Wendell Berry, uh, an author, you all should try to find a book from him and read it. Wendell Berry is his name. He says, eating is an agricultural Everybody here produces in the agri, I mean, participates in the agricultural system by eating. Every time you eat, you are promoting a certain way of producing food and, and a system of agriculture. And it's important, the culture that goes with agriculture is just as important as the benefits to the environment and the benefits to you inside and your health. So when, when, uh, when Alex talks about uh, the difficulty of paying, you know, paying small farmers for the, the cost of their production, you know, because he has to compete with other restaurants, every chef does, every restaurateur does, every 
retailer does. They have to compete with other, other uh, people in the same business who are buying cheap food. Cheap food comes with a, a big back end cost. It, it usually does. Healthcare. When, when you're looking to save money buying food, just be very conscious of the fact that there are a lot of downstream uh, effects that come from that. And every time you buy food or go to a restaurant and buy that food, you should be consciously thinking, am I supporting a local agricultural system? Am I supporting a healthy agricultural system? Am I supporting a local system? And the way to get young farmers involved and uh, you know, farming again is to support them by being willing to pay. You guys are all wealthy, you know, by world standards. You, you can do this. So do it. <laughs>
uh, we're all pressured to hit some uh, uh, sustainable purchasing numbers, not just in Michigan, but across the nation. Every campus has a sustainable program. The Australian beef is showing up on campuses. I think that's a shame because uh, people are checking the box off to buy grass-fed beef. I'm holding back at Michigan. I want the market to move. I'm ready to buy grass-fed beef when it can get to slaughterhouses that we don't have. You're buying some. We're buying some. Chef Frank uh, tells me. Right. Uh, we are looking for opportunities to buy more. Uh, we need to coordinate what I need versus what Alex and the restaurants need. There's prime cuts that deliver a lot of dollars for the, the product. I can't afford $20 a pound uh, for beef. I'm ready to buy everything else that can be ground. I've got almost an unlimited need for ground beef. Why can't you afford everything? I like ground beef. Uh, every time I've been talking about it. The question was, why can't I afford? Never will be able to retire, right? All right. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, we pay pretty good wages. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just raised, I, I employ over 2,000 students. Um, we just raised the wages in our residential dining halls, $2 an hour. They're all making $11 plus. They stick around with us. They're making 15 bucks an hour if they want to take a leadership role. Our uh, full-time employees are uh, uh, part of a, the ASME uh, collective bargaining group. They have living wages. They have full benefits. They have retirement. They have protections around uh, 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 their their job environment. Uh, we're not uh, we're not trying to be a low cost. Uh, the dining program on campus is self-funded. Uh, we our, our income is totally produced by the meal plans we sell and what we can get uh, cash from retail and coffee shops. Uh, the, my prices are controlled. Uh, I'm not able to just say, I, hey, I want 10% uh, more for my meal plans next year, folks, so I can buy some more uh, uh, grass-fed beef. I have to work within the equilibrium I have uh, to figure out how do I switch from conventionally grown products to more organic and more better for you things within the framework of what my food costs is every year. I don't, I can't you mentioned just, the, the Zilke experience um, last year with asparagus. Uh, yeah, um, uh, we, we do have uh, half a dozen direct farm relationships. Vicki uh, uh, and Tom Zilke are one of them. Um, uh, we were committing to buy all their asparagus and for whatever reason it got mixed up a little bit. Uh, we had some transportation issues, delivery issues, connections. They were able to sell their product, but uh, uh, it, it didn't come to us. Uh, another problem we have, uh, we just took a delivery, Zilke's first delivery was, we just bought 20 cases of kale. It's a winter over crop. Um, unfortunately, uh, we started this week buying fresh. We go dark uh, in about a week. 10% uh, of my business is done between now and uh, September. The rest is September through, 90% of it is September through uh, May. We've got a real problem with the sourcing and availability of uh, what's local here. Uh, but I'm a big, uh, uh, I've got a big pool of money to spend. Uh, uh, seconding Alex's uh, roadblocks, number one is the slaughterhouses. We don't have enough uh, availability of uh, uh, animal proteins to us. The second impediment we have is some processing for frozen. Um, so we can take the volume from the summer, get some of this, uh, 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 products so we have supply over the winter that I can be buying more uh, frozen products uh, still push into the local economy I don't, I'm not all that worried about having it fresh but I'm more concerned about local and good for you and, and then the third uh, roadblock we have is really around the accessibility uh, the university can't absorb 20 farmers coming to me uh, and, and frankly I can't uh, I, I want to commit to Zilkies to buy that. If I go get 10 more farmers, I, I can't buy Zilkies asparagus. I've got to buy stuff from everybody else. So uh, in, in my point of view, the solution is more around uh, connecting to the aggregators that are out there. There's already a whole bunch of produce companies that are looking for more produce. I'm pressuring my, the relationships I have for local, whether it's Cisco, whether it's Lagrasso, whether it's... Uh, uh, they all have trucks moving around, they're full in the morning, they're empty going back. Uh, it just seems to me it's kind of a, a no-brainer solution that we have to get this uh, transportation piece coordinated into the <coughs> companies that can sell, not to me, but there's Eastern Michigan, there's the hospital systems, there's K-12, 
there's uh, pretty much an unlimited bucket of purchasing going on here uh, that uh, can th this market can expand pretty dramatically in the, in the uh, future ahead of us. So transportation's a problem. The uh, frozen commodities is a problem for the, the winter, and the excess of uh, fresh local proteins is a real problem for us. So Great. looking to do more. Glad Thank to be you. part of this. Great. conversation beyond nine for the people that want to stay and really learn about it. So I know we're, we're really at our, about our closest. I'm going to let uh, folks that need to go, go in just a minute. And then we're going to uh, ask everybody else to kind of come up a little bit more and we want to continue the conversation. And we're going to go another uh, 45 minutes or so. And uh, anybody who's interested in hearing it or has something to say about it, a couple other things, just a quick announcement before we, we turn it over. Oh, I forgot to thank Raymond. Is anybody here from Raymond yeah. this morning? Yeah. yeah. So you want to just say hi, you guys. Another sponsor for our event. I forgot to call on you. Oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah no, we're, here we are. We're, we're, we're so happy to be here supporting this awesome event. And you always have great speakers, and this is just a, a really awesome topic uh, to hear about. And uh, Raymond, we provide, um, we're a full service accounting firm. So we have the tax side, the audit side. I have uh, Adam Williams is here. I think that might be the only other Raven person. The others are on vacation since we got through Attack. April 18th and <laughs> tax day. Now you're in application or in, in rehab. So <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> probably true. We also have uh, you know uh, full service wealth advisors and uh, corporate investigative services, um, and that's uh, you know we do background checks, um, forensic accounting. You know any other you know investigative all your, type, all your type needs, work. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, we we do a lot, and you know just the whole consulting and so we appreciate helping with business. Sponsoring, and, it's great that, yeah. uh, that you joined us, and uh, yeah, thank, I, you. I thank you very much for doing that. So yeah. it's good to have you. We got a really unique opportunity. Wayne Baker, who's been here before and is a professor at the University of Michigan Business School, has launched a new app, and it's like give and get. The idea is that we, and it's kind of expanding on what we do here. So if people need something, they can put it on this website, and then people who can help can give feedback on that. And you could give feedback. So for example, we did it with our class. These are a couple of my students. There's three or four students here from China. Right? So yes. thank you guys for being here. Stand up. Okay. Your name is? Uh, Lily. My name is Lily, yeah. but my trans name is Lingtong. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lily uh, is a, an entrepreneur. Her father's an entrepreneur in China. So, what did you put up, Lily, for your one? Uh, because I will graduate from this May, so I put in the app is uh, my family's label visit in Ann Arbor, and I need some advice uh, where I must say place in Ann Arbor I should uh, you know take my families to visit. And uh, this right here. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm a student in the UM, definitely. And uh, I really appreciate this app because. Uh, it uh, increased the communication between our classmates and uh, we get some help from our classmates. And also we give some like fabulous advice to our uh, like uh, uh, classmates and fellows and we also get some advice from our professor, like uh, professional advice. So uh, it's really a great app. I think everyone should go uh, get an account and uh, we get connected. So. For this course, I really learned the connection between people is so important. It gives you like great opportunities to learn more things and uh, get a professional advice. And uh, probably the people you connect uh, can help you in your career. So. Well, I think you can get an A from there, but for me this oh, semester, I'm pretty good promotion. I'm supposed you know, to get a four-point GPA. Yeah. <laughs> she learned her lesson well. Thank you very much. And, uh, by the way, I wish you have a conversation. What's going on with China? Food? How do you begin to feed the populations in China? But Wayne's going to be here. He's going to talk about this app, and we're going to use it. So all of us can have the opportunity to sign up for it, 
and then help each other beyond the once a month Leaders Connect. For example, I posted that I want to make a trip uh, following my father's footsteps in World War II when he crossed the Atlantic, uh, crossed uh, Europe, went to Egypt, uh, Iraq, Palestine, and Iran. And uh, on a secret mission, uh, which he still never, he never did tell me before he died exactly what they were doing. But uh, I want to follow those footsteps, so I got all kinds of help from the class in terms of Iranian students who said, hey, it's perfectly safe to go there. They're going to escort me. So I haven't found anybody from Iraq yet, but I just may jump over that and so things are a little calmer there. But that's the kind of thing that you can post. It just doesn't have to be work. So um, I think I'm going to, and then, so Wayne is here in May, and then Ari's going to be here in June. Uh, and he's got a new book about, I think it's about generosity. So uh, we're going to really have a great end of the year activity. I'll let you know about the wine and beer uh, gathering that we're going to have one afternoon uh, in the next month. So uh, those of you that want to stay for the conversation, please come on up closer. Those of you that have to leave, I understand. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, one more appeal to the, to the business leaders of banking. Uh, if you can stay great, I know a lot of people will need to leave. Uh, I really, I can barely survive running my little company, but I am a systems thinker and I want to work with these people. So I will be somebody who you can talk to about what did happen here if you have to go. And I think we really can't imagine a way to, to imagine this way to really fulfill this need for these uh, wholesale buyers. That we don't just try to put it on the shoulders. Okay, okay. Roger, you, are you going to be able to continue to film some of this? So Roger Rail, is, this is all going to be on video. So if you can't stay uh, and you want to refer back to it, uh, check out through my website and set it up. So uh, I'm going to bring up Vince. Uh, Vince, come on up and uh, we can talk about what, what you've been doing. Come on up, enjoy the seat if you want to stay. Go ahead, man. Just talk over the number stop. Okay, my name is Vincent, Vincent Smith, and when, 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 please start quiet, please. Okay, go ahead. I'm just super excited right now to be in a, in a room in front of in front of a, a wonderful group of people just talking about food and just let you know that what, what inspired me and what, what kicked me off and I'm, I'm from a community in Pokey, Florida and I'm a, a Michigan alum, Michigan grad, ex-football player at, at U.S.M. And I grew up in a town called Pokey, Florida, all agricultural and farming. I grew up around cane fields, sugar cane, and we had like no no place where we get like fresh produce or any vegetables, things like that. And it's a lot of diabetes and a lot of issues in my community, which I thought would be super cool to just have a nice safe place like Argus, like a, a, a nice healthy food place you can get all local, like fruits, vegetables, meats, and things of that sort of uh, nature. And I thought it's like, it's so expensive and I thought it would be cool to just create like a community garden and just build a, organization where athletes can just go into a community building fruits and vegetables and also just in, in, in engaging in, into the community and just getting the kids out there and just inspiring them because I grew up chasing rabbits, eating like regular food which I see I skin it and eat it so it's a, it, it hit home with me and just expanding it and, and seeing like other athletes after their football careers and, and not being able to have jobs and things of like that, just teaming up together and going back to the elementary schools, the high got, schools. Got, if people uh, want to support you, could you give them, uh, show them on your shirt there what it says? It says, uh, well, it's the Team Garden, it's called Team Garden, the hashtag eating project. You can see on the shirt, you can go to, we have a GoFundMe up, it's called feedflint.org. And you can purchase a t-shirt and all of the t-shirt purchases goes back into the garden for tools, rakes, gloves, things like that. And also like it's just like working with all different types of organizations. Especially I mentioned her name was Catherine with the bars, like with athletes and like healthy bars and also like with, with different like healthy varieties because we didn't have much as far as just growing up knowing about like fruits and vegetables and, and health issues and things like that. And so Vince could, Vince could really use your support on 
uh, his nonprofit that he started. Uh, and if, if anybody has ideas about ways to generate revenue, he's in Flint, he's in Ipsy, he's in Detroit, all over the country bringing in some of the star athletes to promote this idea. So it would be great if you could reach out to him uh, through his website or today. So uh, I want to thank you very much for what you You're new to the community, and you're to say well, I'm not new to the community. New to the job. I'm new to the job. Okay. Um, so, uh, my position is Did the. You say your name, Jay. I'm sorry. Sure, Jay Gerhardt. Um, my job is to be the Washtenaw County Local Foods Coordinator. Um, it's yeah. a job. Yeah, it's very exciting. <laughs> Essentially, what happened is the county recognized this need that there was a gap and that by having someone to aggregate for farmers, we could boost economic development. And so I'm employed by Michigan State Extension, but using county dollars. Um, so essentially, all of the things that these people have talked about, that they are like, this is our problem. That's what I have to fix. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I don't have that much time to do it. Um, but it's really exciting because this county is already positioned for success. There's so many people out there. There's distribution companies working on this. There's buyers ready to buy. There's farmers ready to sell. There's people like Art, like Kathy and Bill, who are yesers and are just like, yeah, how can we help you? How can we make this all a reality? So it's exciting. Um, there was, I just want to second this thing about food processing and meat. Those are another two things, two business startups that we really could use in this county to bridge some gaps um, and get food into our institutions, which is what I see as kind of the next level. We have a direct-to-consumer is, is already a big industry here, but getting into schools, getting into hospitals, getting into university dining halls is um, kind of like the next tier. So, um, what was the other? Oh, and the other thing I want to say, since there's all these bankers here, <laughs> access to capital for farmers is a huge hurdle. And I farmed for six years, um, and it's there. There are creative ways that we could go about this. There's a report by Michael Schumann. He uh, it's a 25% report commissioned by the Washtenaw um, Washtenaw Com Community Council Economic Development. COED, um, they, and, and he uh, has interviewed many people in the community about, um, you know, what are, the, what are the biggest hurdles for farmers? Access to capital, oh, time and time again, is, is it. So um, I would like to invite all of us to just stay, stay involved in the conversation, stay creative about ways that we can um, make access available for farmers. For funds. I also want to invite Amanda up yeah, here. Yeah, that. <laughs> because Amanda is the what are you executive director of Growing Hope, which is an amazing organization. Ipsy. I'll let you do it. Good morning. Amanda, Thank you. you. Come this way so cool. Brian sure. can uh, get you a full video here. Yeah. Uh, good morning. I'm Amanda Edmonds. So I have a, a lot of different hats I wear, but one of them is as executive director of Growing Hope. Uh, We've been around for 13 years and our, we're dedicated to helping people grow and access healthy food. So we're the equity voice in this and based in, we're in Ypsilanti. We work, uh, our core work is in Ipsy. People come to us from throughout the region and I do a significant amount of work, advocacy and policy work uh, around the state um, and, and Lansing quite frequently um, looking at that policy level. I can talk about many different things that we do. Our work is uh, organized around gardens, helping people grow and access healthy food uh, from the garden perspective, uh, or at farmers markets. We run multiple farmers markets. I'll say a little bit more about that in one second. Uh, mobile farm stands, farmers market consulting across the state, farmers market policy work, farmers market evaluation, economic impact. So that's an area we do work with about 700 um, youth a year in the Ipsy area doing healthy cooking, nutrition, gardening, school food policy, farm to school, the whole world of that. And then we have a whole wing of economic development. Um, and so we're working in a community. Uh, my community, I do also happen that I'll be the mayor of the city of Ypsilanti. In the city of Ypsilanti, 30% of our residents live below the poverty line, and we don't have a full-service grocery store in our city limits. 
So one of those barriers that we see in our community and that I've been working on for many years, um, in some ways unsuccessfully, while we see the overabundance, in some ways oversaturation of the retail grocery industry in the Ann Arbor area, I have literally courted and in so many ways, local, regional, and national grocers and can't get anyone because our numbers don't work in the way that retail grocery works. So we think about and we hear these stories about food deserts and there's a lot of politicization to that, to that term, um, but that is a very real thing in our community. And I give the statistic uh, frequently that in Chelsea, the average age of death, death is 84 and in Ypsilanti Township, it's 66. So in our county, the equity issues around food and food access are extreme and people I think especially in um, the wealthier parts of our county don't get just the level of disparities and what that means that you can't expect to live almost 20 years less if you live on my side of the county than if you live on just to just to the west of there. Um, that data is not from gun violence or lots of things the media might um, want you to think. That, that uh, disparity in death is from cardiovascular disease which is diet and exercise related which directly relates more and more studies locally and nationally find to access to healthy food. So in 2006, Growing Hope started our downtown Ypsilanti Farmers Market, proud to have been the third market in the state of Michigan to accept SNAP. As of last year, of our 350 plus markets around the state, that, that uh, industry sector has boomed. Uh, uh, almost 150 accepted SNAP. So we do training and consultation all over the county and all over the state around farmers markets accepting food assistance. Half of our farmers market customers, um, uh, when there's about 20,000 customer visits a year at our two XC markets, have household incomes under uh, $25,000. And food stamp and other food assistance sales makes up 28 to 30 percent of our overall sales. So people think that low-income folks don't want healthy food, and that's crap. Excuse my language. Um, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of assumptions about who wants local, healthy, sustainably produced food. And we uh, prove by uh, by data always and by action that people in communities of all sorts, uh, including our community of Ypsilanti, demand local and healthy food. Now that also supports our local food economy. So we're also in our work in economic development, growing our 90 plus uh, entrepreneurs we work with in our markets every year with wraparound services. We have a building blocks for food entrepreneur free workshop series because we're often working with low income uh, and, and uh, vendors of color, whether they're a farmer, whether they're a, a cottage food producer or another kind of vendor. And so we're doing those uh, services as well to help to grow that local uh, food economy. So um, in Ipsy, it's about thinking about how we create the system with that strong, strong, strong equity lens. I'll just say one other thing is that um, I'm a founding member. Uh, Tim Redmond is also with us uh, of the Washington Food Policy Council. So we needed to move in this uh, community several years ago. We need to start moving our work to a policy level. So, you know, uh, the policy that allowed the healthy vending in the county, that was part of what came out of work at our great county public health department and our local food policy count account, local food policy council, where we're looking at both local, school district, university, institutional level, state and federal policy change, and how we need to fix some of these problems and barriers, and where we need to make um, those policy shifts to do so. So I encourage you to get involved with the, uh, with the Washington Food Policy Council, because if we don't change those systems, like I was um, very fortunate to be a part of with the cottage food law back in 2010, then, then we don't make the systemic institutional change we need. So oh, I can stop. key points. It really is five the sweet spot. One is passion. I think you got it. <laughs> the other is skill set. I think this group here has it. Uh, the other is uh, values. And obviously we're hearing about the values. And, but this, the other part is money. Is the finance, what's going to drive that financially? So you can see how there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of passion, a lot of skills. But how do we drive this financially? And I want to call on some people that might be able to help with that. Charlie is one here. Uh, so Charlie, uh, I've known for quite a while also, and runs a program at Wash, you're at Washington, but you're not part of Washington. But like, well, whatever, you can explain it. Sure. And he can help fledgling businesses, or even businesses that exist. So he can start up, he can also help people grow who have existing businesses. He can help with access to capital, access with business uh, activity. So maybe you can tell us what you got available, Charlie, and how it might relate. Is there any companies that have been in the food industry that you work with? Let us know. Sure. Th thanks, Rob. Uh, as he mentioned, as Rob mentioned, my name is Charlie Penner. I'm the regional director for the Michigan Small Business 
Development Center, which is based locally at Washtenaw Community College. And we've worked with uh, many of the people in this room. We have a pretty strict client confidentiality policy, so I can't say who they are. Uh, but we've worked with a lot of the businesses here. Our first stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so we, we work with all kinds of small businesses uh, in, in all industries, all sectors, but a lot of them interest right now is in food. And so we uh, help them through uh, classes, so the building blocks of local food. We have people helping with that. We were involved with the uh, uh, Washington Pitch Competition the other night. Um, and we have classes both in person and online. Uh, for small businesses of all types. We also do free confidential one-on-one -on -one counseling. So we'll sit down with you, help you with your business plan, help you with your marketing plan, and help you provide and find that access to capital, whether it's going through traditional bank financing, whether it's crowdfunding that a lot of people are interested in. Uh, we're working on some of the local investment initiatives that are floating around and, and trying to uh, find creative ways to finance uh, some of these less uh, traditional businesses or where the numbers don't work out as, uh, uh, as they might, um, what can we do about that? So happy to talk to anybody uh, who's interested in, in business assistance and a lot of what we try to do is connect people to those who can help them. So we send a lot of people to, to Jeff and to Amanda and others who are looking for that. Uh, we'd love to be able to send people to the university so to catch up with you afterwards in the county. Um, so if, you, if you're looking for direct business assistance, I'll stick around and be happy to talk to anybody. Thanks. Thank you, Tomorrow. Is there something else? Um, uh, we created, you won't see actually Growing Hope's name on it or, or logo on it at all, but we created a website and a brand um, last year called washdownmarkets.org um, to sort of raise all ships uh, around to spread the word about farmers markets all over the county. It's up to date this year, so it's a basic, simple website that's a directory. You'll see bus ads this season that we're uh, getting gonna get going. So washdownmarkets.org if you want to find your farmers market anywhere in Washington County. Um, and it of course has full information about what bus line you can get there on um, from a transportation access standpoint as well as what forms of food assistance um, and links to how you access some of that food assistance if you don't know. So check out washdownmarkets.org and you can find links and info on any of the markets in Washington County. So I guess I'd like to highlight one part of Argus um, that may be relevant here. You know, so Argus has been a, an experiment. You know, can it really work to set up a market that's between a grocery store and a farmer's market? And behind that concept, Kathy and I, we'd spent a lot of time in nonprofits and raised money through all kinds of fundraisers and so forth. And we thought, you know, why, why does local food have to have like a fundraiser? You know, people buy food every day, and right now the problem is they're buying it and all that money is going out of state, like the vast majority of the time. With Argus, um, there's a finite amount of startup capital that was needed. Um, there are grants from the USDA that, uh, that are looking to fund exactly these kinds of initiatives. Um, within a year, it's been self-funding, um, and um, you know, we're not working in it every day. It's the staff is running it. Um, and Kiki and Rahani are setting theirs up where they're gonna run it and also really be in it every, every day. But I think about like who comes to Argus. Uh, we did a survey and found that 50% of our, the, the customers that are spending this $1.3 million last year walk to the store. 50% um, come by car and they live within two miles. And so if you think about like an alternative funding source, you know, it could be to put another similar model store on Plymouth Road, one on Packard, um, and one in Ipsy. One in Ipsy is, <laughs> it, we're, and we're talking now with probably 15 or 20 different groups across the country, from Vancouver to Denver to Ypsilanti to Jackson to uh, Grand Rapids to Detroit. Um, there are lot. There's lots of interest in this model because it's harnessing consumer power as your funding source, um, and. I think about what uh, the, the difference that you know the fifteen thousand dollars made to Brett and his farm. Uh, that ten thousand dollar limit is what really puts farmers over, like from being able to stay in farming or not each each year. Um, and if there was a community that had such a friendly and receptive place for local farms that committed to it, you know, I think it could really be a you know a source of competitive 
advantage um, long term for, for this region. So I just want to call out that there's this other source of funding, you know, called all the consumers who are dying to buy local but can't can't make it to you know to their market on that appointed day. Can I pick up on that? One one thing that's really unique about what you're doing, you talked about the percentages, this 80-20. And uh, I think I, I'm loving to hear that you're modeling that, and we're going to see more of these. That are, there's something like that. Even food co-ops right now are really being challenged by, you know, getting their message co-opted by the Whole Foods and whatnot. And whether it's co-op or Whole Foods, the farmers may be getting something like 50% of those dollars. So a model, you know, that that is at this percentage, I think, and like the Whole Foods. I mean, you've got all these hurdles to get in there, like getting through food safety and all this, and you're skipping all that. You're really letting the farmer sell the food through your model in some way. I wanted to try to direct this back to the group a little bit. To, like, how do we imagine this okay, growing? Let me, let me just, I yeah. got an exercise for yeah. you. Can I, that's my thing. So let me, me no, here's what I'm going to suggest. To get, to get all of you involved uh, is, why don't each of you take two or three people and uh, we'll, we'll call small, form small groups for 10 minutes. And let's see if each of those groups could come up with an idea of um, something that would advance the local food economy. What, what is needed? We've talked about everything from uh, grains to slaughterhouses to financing. So I want to get everybody involved. We, it's still a big crowd here. So I wonder if you guys could just fan out maybe and we'll take 10 minutes, we'll lead some small discussions. So I, get, I, I would say about three, three people, three, four people per group. And uh, you guys could facilitate. Maybe and uh, specific groups too, like finance would be one. All of right, let's see if we got that. So, what, Jeff, finance? Yeah. Who's interested in finance? A couple, a couple people join finance. Okay, go ahead. Um, aggregation. Aggregation. Aggregation group that you two are. All right, a uh, couple people with aggregation. Matt. Finance. Why don't we go in the back? Okay, okay. finance in the back. Uh, Amanda, what do you want to leave here? Uh, Anything you want. Uh, passion. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, you, know, you want to do like people that are interested in doing a model like this? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and logistics. All right, logistics. Uh, creating an Argus Farm model. Talk to Rahini over here. Anybody want to join Rahini? And then other ones just fan out and see what we can do. Um, so it's not really much. All right, I'll get everybody in now. You guys see us. So I, uh, I'm just changing gears over here. I'm just the uh, local meat. Okay. So if you guys get uh, they're, they're, uh, I, I, I believe so. Okay. So they're working with uh, some slaughterhouses locally. Okay. Uh, was really important for Bill and Kathy's model, which they spoke about too, was the walkability. The fact that it's a neighborhood uh, gathering space as well as um, a retail food location. Uh, and when Kiki and I were thinking about um, having to potentially uh, look at different uh, options for commercial space in Detroit, which, mind you, is incredibly difficult to find, um, becoming incredibly expensive, we uh, had the opportunity uh, to, to go into a really beautiful space on Michigan Avenue, which a lot of people know about. Slows is there, you've got a lot of bars going on there. But we opted for um, a little uh, smaller uh, neighborhood uh, commercial space that is uh, a lot more walkable. We, we strongly believe that we're going to be able to create a really beautiful community gathering space there, which is very important to us, the model, um, and also for the community. So uh, that's, we talked a lot about why we actually chose our position and why that's important to us. Uh, you know, anybody that's been to Argus, you know that relationships are key. 
Um, you know that you have a wonderful experience when you're there. Uh, even if Bill and Kathy aren't there, the staff are amazing, they're very helpful, very friendly, um, and that will be very, very important for us as well. So that's, that's what we did. We, we did not conquer or um, find a solution to our logistical issues. <laughs> but we will! We will, that's the attitude. <laughs> Got, got a mic here. Oh, no, she's yeah. not. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. You go right ahead. Um, my group sidetracked as well, big time. Um, but something that came up while we were discussing um, was something that I forgot to mention, which is um, certification and gap certification. Um, and there's a lot of work being done in the community to try to get farmers that certification so that they can sell to institutions. Um, Group GAP was just signed from the USDA uh, a couple weeks ago, so it's a legal program now, um, instead of a pilot program. Um, Cherry Capital's been doing a lot of work to make a Group GAP for Michigan. Um, they already have a really awesome Group GAP up in Traverse City. People might not know what Cherry Capital is. Oh, Cherry Capital, yeah. or GAP. Right. Oh my right. goodness, yeah. sorry. Uh, all right, back up. GAP stands for Good Agriculture Practices. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a it's the USDA regulation um, OSHA requires it. Um, so if you want to sell to any dining halls, uh, Chartwells, or any other K through 12 um, private cafeteria uh, business, you have a farm has to be GAP certified. Um, and Group GAP is the is the way for small farms to get GAP certified by creating a group and then you create your own certification within that group. Um, and, then, and then you have the USDA certifier that certifies the group. Um, it's cheaper, it's, um, it creates your kind of own internal um, audit system. So, um, so that's happening and I, I see it as we're almost there. I think that we can get more farms gap certified within a year. So, that's my hope anyway. All right. I like, I like the, you know, we can do it attitude. Not just yeah. your hope, that's your, that's your vision. Your mission. Right? Your mission, there you go. Hi, my name is Scott Welser, uh, Welser Farms. I'm, I'm now looking for a group to gap with if anyone out there is looking to <laughs> connect their farm with another farm. Um, I spoke with Steve over here about some meat. I was asked to represent uh, some farmers who had a tr problem getting their 80-20 uh, grass-fed, no hormone, no antibiotic beef and pigs to market. Uh, they're kind of in a dead zone up in the east side of the state. We didn't even get to my heirloom tomatoes, which, no offense, your dining hall might not be able to afford because they're <laughs> kind of a, my specialty crop. Well, let's get you um, a little bit of money there. Yeah. Well, uh, I sell them outside. I go down to some of the best restaurants in Detroit, which you guys, yes, we're going to speak also. Um, but we were just speaking about, I've had a problem trying to represent the meat because most of the restaurants don't have capacities to buy a quarter cow and store it. Um, and then they only want the primal cuts. Well, this gentleman over here sounds like he can take all the ground beef you can get and uh, might have just helped him solve a problem and uh, solve the problem for some farmers. Um, <laughs> Not sure where I'll fit into it. I've been very sensitive. I met the Amish villain of Northeast Michigan, um, who represents like 12 guys and takes them down to market. But uh, trying not to be that person, but the person that helps connect. And if I make a little helping somebody out, then that's what happens. But trying to create all the supply chains here, because there's a lot of meat up in that part of the state, and nobody seems to be tapping in. The connection we make is through my delivery system. Uh, it, last year we broke up Cisco's monopoly on our purchasing piece and we've added uh, Mark's Quality Meats as our uh, local supplier for proteins. So the connection is to get his farmers to talk to Mark's, uh, their slaughter, I'm sure they've got a relationship with the slaughterhouse up in that part of the state and then they can process. The funny thing is they have to go all the way to Yale, Seroy's, to even get their yeah. meat processed. So, uh, about 130 miles. Mark's is a pathway into me so we can handle the liability and the food safety and all those parts that one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one we can't manage. And then the other doorway into me is through Lagrasso Produce right now, who's a uh, uh, aggregator in Detroit. And the same thing, if you've got produce to sell, 
uh, they send us a, sh a sheet every week with the local products we have available to us, and if the price is right, we buy them. It's that simple. So unfortunately, our business is slow now. So it's, uh, in September, we'll be back on the street in volume. Uh, Lily, you had an idea here? Yeah. Yes, I am a, a electrical engineer and a computer science uh, student. So I have a thought. I currently I figured out uh, the problem is about connection. The farms, uh, uh, small farms, they want to sell their product. And the like dining hall and the Zigman's restaurant, they want to buy some product. Everybody know the Facebook and the Craigslist. Why don't we launch an app for restaurant and uh, uh, it's like a build an online market for farms and uh, the market. The farms they can create their own profile. They posted a video, their pictures of their farms. And uh, the uh, Zingman's they have an account. They say this month we want to beef and we want to work. And they have uh, both have a uh, connect information. And uh, you know you can search on this app uh, the beef, and uh, you can have the uh, farms who want to sell the beef, and the market they want to buy beef, and also the farms they can post the video how they raise their cows and how they uh, raise their vegetables. That's what I have an idea. So I mean, uh, the agriculture should build more connection with engineering because we have engineering ideas and uh, we know how to advertisement uh, the local farms on the Google and the Facebook. And uh, more people they know the importance of uh, the food. So I think the uh, Washington County they have uh, this ability to launch this app to help the local farms and uh, the build this online market. Thank you, Good idea. Uh, uh, Lily's not just talking because she's uh, one of the uh, students in one of the premier programs of computer, computer science in the world here at the University of Michigan. We have access to those students, many of whom are very interested in this topic and would like to uh, help in the, in the way that they can. So I think that's, that's very, very powerful. Did we hear from anybody on the finance side? Who would like to speak from that group? Uh, Okay, I was. Um, you want to say who you are? Yes, I'm Kate O'Hara, and um, I spent a lot of time in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, Sausalito. So um, I'm back and forth, and here in Michigan, um, I was just talking with uh, Barry, and a lot of um, what we were. Or I guess what I, I was kind of talking to Zero for. Um, I've been working with a company uh, that does um, more of a broadcasting television for the dental offices and also for the hospitals. And what I find is that we seem to be um, leaving out the medical community and the dental community. One of the things that I've been talking to different people is that um, you know we need to put the mouth back in the body. It's been kind of a discussion that's been had and so everybody's like well what does that mean well what happens is we're you know if you go way back when where they say um, let food be thy medicine and let thy medicine be thy food so what I'm finding is that by um, going into the farms like the St. Joe um, Hospital um, they, they have a farm out there a greenhouse and um, Henry Ford and by looking at what's going on with the, the dentists and you know instead of them just handing out candy they can actually be um you know having food that they're you know involved with and discussions that are being um, talked about so going back to you know one thing that i know about raising money um i had a, an interesting fellow who used to call, every time i call him up and talk to him he'd say hey get a contract so what I'm, and I know these are a lot of different ideas and you know, they're rattling around in my head, so um, this is you know, part of, I think, a discussion, but as far as financing is concerned, I think if we were to go to these medical um, hospitals or go to the dental uh, community and say, you know, let's start talking and having real organic you know, food instead of processed food, instead of you know, whatever, and maybe getting contracts and saying, 
you know, something along that line. Yeah. Have you heard of uh, Kaiser Permanente's model out west? Uh, no, I a large hospital system, and they're as far east as Colorado now. They have several in the Bay Area, and they, I forget what the percentages are, but they, they have a huge percentage of organic food buy, huge. And they started out very small with a small farmer's market at one of their stores in Oakland, I believe, um, because the doctors wanted farmer's market food. But then it transitioned into their purchasing department, actually purchasing vast quantities of really good food to be prepared in the hospitals, because the hospitals are feeding garbage too. They're perpetuating their job, I get it, but... And, and the farm the farm at St. Joe's, um, Alex, right? Yeah. They're... Certainly better than nothing. Yeah, they're still... <laughs> That's pretty progressive, but they're still not um, putting it into the patients yet. Right, the system just pulls up with the process. Yeah. I mean, they, and you know, and so a lot of people talk about, well, there's farmer's markets, like, you know, at Allegiance Hospital in Jackson, or there's farmer's markets, um, you know, and, and it's, it's really interesting because I went to um, just sort of another thing, um, I don't know if this is so much finance, but I went to the um, food co-op uh, in, here in Ann Arbor, they had um, something that was a permaculture um, showing of a movie called Inhabit uh, about two nights ago. And it was just incredible. And one other thing that I wanted to mention is that Roger has a group that he started a couple of years ago. It's just wonderful. It's a videography group. And he told me um, just the other night that they're doing something with documentaries. So, what is oh, documentaries about the end? Right. So, when I saw this in Habit, and you know, and we're talking about how do you get the, you know, the word out? How do you get money? How do you, um, you know, grow this whole area? The thing might be to, you know, check out his, you know, videography group, um, you know, and, and see what would happen if we told these stories, like our farm story, or you know, even the the. The fellow Brett with the Brett you know, Seabury. Yeah, I mean, these are stories that everybody wants to hear and talk about. And anyway, thank you so much. Hey, what do you do? What is your work? Uh, I'm freelancing. Freelancing okay. as a as a marketing uh, or yes, client um, partner. Yeah. So I wanted to also, uh, Alex uh, has done a great job of talking about the lower house. But, you know, Zingerman's itself, 35 years, has changed the food scene here in Ann Arbor, totally. I mean, you know, we used to have a choice between chop suey and pizza when I first came to town. And neither of them was that good, as far as I recall. But uh, when Zingerman's came in, uh, you know, it has created, I mean, nine businesses at this point, something like that, I'm moving up to, what's, what's your vision for how many you want to have in the next 10 years? Alex? 12 to 18. 12 to 18. So I would think, just even if people could be creative, thinking about what businesses could be a Zingerman business to expand. I mean, what, you know, there, I don't believe there's a Zingerman's grocery store, for example. Uh, I don't believe there's a Zingerman's, uh, like a food truck that could go to stores or, or uh, you know, go to schools, I mean. You know, there's just, if you can be creative, you have access to one of the finest, uh, accelerators for food in the world right here. And they only want local businesses. So I would think this would be a great opportunity to, you know, what could you do that would be a Zingerman's business? And I, I, there's no limits to it, is it, as long as it follows? Could you speak to that, Alex? Yeah. Just respond. Well, our, I can speak loud enough. Our recipe uh, for, for a new business is that it has to be food related. It has to be in Washington County. And it has to have a managing partner like myself that drives it. So Paul and Ari will talk to pretty much anyone that is within those guidelines about uh, becoming a managing partner and starting a business within our organization. Our mission is to grow the organization. Uh, we have we provide health care to 86% of our employees so, and everybody that wants it. We work incredibly hard to have very diverse health plans available. Um, everybody in our, I mean the food and beverage industry in this nation is terrible in terms of like three out of five um, women within healthcare industry are on food stamps nationwide and the poverty level, the vast, we're 700 people in our organization, the vast majority are living paycheck to paycheck and constantly within danger of being 
homeless and hungry. And so we try very hard. We have an $11 starting wage in our organization. We're pushing towards um, 15, I think, by 2020 as our own minimum wage, which is pathetic to think that people are feeding their family on that sort of wages. But our competition is paying $3.15 an hour. Our competition is paying cooks $8 an hour, $9 an hour. You can't live on that. I mean, what we're paying is not sustainable or thrivable, but you know, stretch of the image, it's not thrivable. It's maybe, maybe livable. It's better. It's better, better is better. I mean, we constantly push the envelopes. And what the people in New York City are like, Mr. Myers, who is a wonderful restaurateur, talking about, we pay our cooks every bit as much as he's paying in Manhattan. Alex, are there, I know that you are, are responsive to ideas, but are there needs that you guys have identified that you'd love to see people start? Businesses that could be affiliated with Zingerman's, or is that all? Well, a very imaginative person. There's little that wouldn't work. I mean, it could be a cookbook store. It has to be food related. It could be an app. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jimmy. Um, I just want to say that uh, Charlie and Debbie and, and uh, Jeff and the other gentleman is gone. Mary? Larry. Golf. Larry. Farmer. Large conventional farmer. Great. Larry. Uh, uh, Lawrence uh, Golf. Larry. Yeah. Anyway, we were talking about the possibility of a business accelerator. The idea being to find the wealth here in town, invite the wealth and the capital to be in one room. Entrepreneurs, the, the uh, young farmers or older farmers, whoever, um, people in the food business with ideas who need capital to be in the room as well and for pitches to be made to these capital pools. Local shark tank. Hmm? Like a local shark tank. Yeah, like a local shark tank, only there's not going to be any sharks in it. And no one's going to be in terms of that would be a great idea to create an accelerator. We have tech accelerators, we have pharmaceutical accelerators, right. but you know, they have yeah. food, yeah. food business. Food or farm, that's a great idea. Farm accelerators that the farm like that. Yeah. Farm yeah. capital accelerators. So, so people talk about growing wealth, this is actually growing food. That's a <laughs> radical idea. I want to so, mention that uh, yeah. the, uh, Ray yeah. and I and a couple of people. Good luck with the store. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, all right. We were at a food uh, policy council meeting last night, and Ray, uh, Ray is interested in this, too. So I, I just want to say, if any of you are interested in this idea, it's going to take a little work. Maybe it'll be a fall project. Maybe it'll be sometime in the winter. But I'd like to see it happen. And, uh, all right. So we're going to wrap up, but I would very much like to see this conversation continue. Uh, Steve Angerman and I have talked about being willing to volunteer our time to run a smaller group, uh, 10, 15 people that might meet monthly to help with their businesses around this. And we're open to all kinds of ideas in terms of ways to use Leaders Connect. Uh, because the, the, the demand out there is great. I mean, how many of you have uh, children? How many of your children are foodies? I mean, I ran into a, a guy, uh, the McNaughton's, uh, they're a, a entrepreneur couple, Brandon and uh, Hannah McNaughton, anybody know those folks? But their kid is uh, 10, and he's a total foodie. You know, he, he wants to be a chef. I mean, I want him to be a baseball player. He has a better <laughs> chance of succeeding than I do. <laughs> so, uh, again, I think, you know, I was with my granddaughter who's two years old, and they, my son is really going, daughter are really going out of their way be sure she's getting healthy snacks. Uh, she, you know, we gave her an ice cream cone for her second birthday. I think that's the first time she had eaten something like that. You know, and it was just, uh, I think there's a tremendous recognition among young people. So the marketplace is there. So what, I, what I'm going to suggest is that, first of all, watch the video, distribute the video. We'll have it up. Um, usually we have it by early next week. So um, Diane will be sure to You've also been writing down some resources, I think, and so we'll try to put out a, a, a Dr. Rob column around this event and share with you the resources. But next month, I think it's the 20th, Diane, when, uh, May 20th, May 20th let, we're gonna have uh, Wayne Baker in, and his app would be very good, it's give and take, and it's about posting things that would be 
you know, people want, like Alex, you had some uh, goat uh, milking equipment, right? And his, his app is called the Reciprocity Ring. It's a new one he's got, it's called Give and Take now, so yeah. And, uh, but Alex was able just to talk to Bill and Kathy about uh, your goat milking thing, and already I heard somebody, somebody wanted to buy that in here. Who was that that spoke up about that? Steve. Really? Steve, okay. So, uh, you know, there, there's this opportunity to support each other, which I think is really a key tipping point thing for any industry to succeed. We see that in Silicon Valley. Well, this could be, you know, we need to come up with a cool name and a cool logo for it. But, uh, you know, Washtenaw Valley or something like that. But uh, it's not too cool. But we can figure it out. Silicon Valley isn't that cool either. We can think about the name. What's that? But uh, we'll resume the conversation at 9 a.m. on May 20th. So if you can come to the Wayne's event, great. If you can't get there, uh, let's, uh, you're welcome to come at 9 and join the conversation right here. Who else should be at the table that's not here? I mean, I'm thinking Jeff Irwin. I'm thinking the mayor. Uh, who else do we need that we should make an appeal to get to the table? Amanda knows everybody who should be here. Amanda, can you name some names? Maybe we can get those people. I mean, there's lots of people. And, and there are other forums where the food people are talking to each other about these system issues. And the, the right thing might be to, we have representations from all sectors at the Food Policy Council. So okay. maybe to invite the banking and the finance community more into that. Okay. There's lots of ways that you see each other all the time. Yeah, we don't want to recreate the wheel. But, but the gap is really some of the financial and banking people, um, some aren't as engaged in sort of understanding the sector. Yeah, I think one of the things with Leaders Connect, the community that I work with here, is that the business opportunity. You know, is there a business case? Eric, you teach this. Eric teaches entrepreneurship with you. And there's a lot of wealth in this community, a lot of angel money, people looking for investment. They're always looking high tech, fast turnaround. But actually, they don't need that. They, some of people just want to do something that is the right thing to do. And a lot of people have grandkids, they want to see. So could we get that capital flowing into supporting uh, the local food economy? I think that would be a great venue for this. So I'll try to get the venture capital people. And John, maybe you can help me on some of the key angel funds and you know let people know about this opportunity. We could tap into some of the students. That's another area you don't get access to here. You know, you have, you have teams of people that are working right on these kind of projects. Yeah, we just did our big <coughs> showcase of all the the most successful teams, and so like there's like a oatmeal pop-up that's doing business, selling this really cool artisan oatmeal. I was thinking maybe I don't know. Right? So that you know, all kinds of interesting uh, ideas that are coming up. With. Yeah. And I think also, uh, I know Eric's wife is a family physician. Uh, we should get the medical and, and dental communities involved in this too. I mean, because people are sometimes just doing stupid things, like putting candy out. I mean, you know, Hershey's is making a fortune. Just wherever you go, I mean, trying to lose weight and you know be hungry at three o'clock. And there's candy wherever you are in the workplace. Can it be healthier snacks? Uh, you know, even choices for people to take a few carrots. So, what can be done, Roger? You want to say a few things? Yeah, I help with uh, A2 New Tech and Detroit New Tech, which is uh, usually four or five young companies come and pitch what they're all about for five minutes. And we've had several companies that are in the food area. Like there's food circles that kind of coordinate some of the locally grown food. And there is an app that, from a couple of years ago, I think it's called Food Spotter, where they crowdsource what's in the farmer's markets in the morning. So you can go there and say, well, this is what's in the market here. So there's already some of this going on. There's already some overlap in the tech community. I just want people to know that. Well, I think that one of the things is that we building that overlap is, is cool in the sense of like, we want momentum. I think that's what's needed. And I'm gonna let Bill and Kathy and Alex, if you guys have any last words, Bill, your reaction to this? And is it kind of what you expected and hoped for? What's going on in your mind? No, I just, I mean, to wrap it up, I think, we, so we were thrilled that this group showed up, and I felt like, you know, if we were on an island, we had enough skill and capacity to start our own food system um, across the spectrum here. So it was, it was amazing uh, to see this energy. So I, mean, I think, yeah, so thank you all for coming. Go get something to eat. Let's talk a lot. I might do it. Look at that. I might do it.